Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And tonight we have a very interesting and in depth sponsored stream tonight. A major shout out goes out to Jeffrey Ivy for sponsoring tonight's stream. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, he's been a very generous supporter over the years of, of my work and the program. So um, he actually wanted me to speak about, he said, Hey, have you ever read this book? on the division of nature. I said, no, I haven't. And this is a ninth century philosophical text by John the Scot or John Scotus Irigina. And this is, it's called Paraphysion uh, or in English on the division of nature. And he's like, Hey, I'd love for you to do a sponsored stream on that. I didn't know what exactly I was getting into. I was like, yeah, sure. You know, as a, as a poor, humble man, I'll do anything for a sponsored stream. And uh, this one was pretty in depth. This is, we're going to be diving. You're going to need your thinking cap for tonight because we're going to be getting into a lot of philosophical categories and understandings. Because essentially, what this book is, is a synthesis uh, of a sort of Neoplatonic understanding of ontology, the cosmos, human anthropology mixed with. A unique reading of obviously he was Western. John Scotus uh, was a philosopher, theologian in the Carolingian Empire in the court of Charles the Bald. This is in the middle of the 800s, the ninth century. And one of the unique features about him is he was one of the only Latin speaking scholars or, or Latin scholars that could translate Greek. And so he is responsible for the translation of the celestial hierarchy and the other works by. Dionysius, often referred to as Pseudo-Dionysius. Uh, that is a debated, but we'll continue with the Pseudo-Dionysius. That's generally how scholasticism refers to it. The question is, did Pseudo-Dionysius, was he after um, the Neoplatonist or was the Neoplatonist reading Dionysius? And he was the, the Saint Dionysius that was converted by Paul at the, he was the Areopagate um, there in Athens. It's, it's a debate. It's a debate. But John... Scotus was the first one to actually translate Pseudo Dionysius into Latin. He was the first one to translate Saint Maximus, the entire entirety of the Ambigua, um, into Latin. And so he has a really unique reading of Christianity. Now, there's a reason why he's not a saint. Um, and I want we're going to be again giving credit where credit is due. He's actually a very interesting historical figure. But he is not a saint because of his Neoplatonism. He essentially is synthesizing. Uh, Neoplatonic philosophy with uh, the Christian tradition. And he reads people like a little bit of, of St. Basil the Great, but mostly Gregory of Nyssa with his apophatic theology, um, Pseudo Dionysius with his apophatic theology regarding the transcendence of God, and then St. Maximus's theology, uh, most importantly in regards to the cosmic Christology of Jesus Christ, right? Because what, what is now? St. Maximus did a lot of great things. Sorry, I got something in my eyelash. Um, but his logos logi distinction, understanding the divine principles of creation. This is going to be huge for, for John Scotus because he is basically wanting to reinterpret or give a new framework for the incarnation of the logos. Now, obviously, Neoplatonism, as we know, the logos is a demiurge. The logos is the first creation of God. Not so... With, Scott, with John Scotus. So he's departing from the Neoplatonic tradition because he's adopting the, the, trini the Trinity, the Christian Trinity. And he's arguing that, in fact, the Logos is not created. It is begotten of the Father. Godhead is a Trinitarian structure. And so then St. Maximus affords him to sort of 
bring in his Neoplatonic understanding, th this, this preeminence on unity. You know, one of the things we'll get into is, um, you know, historically, although he hedges his bets, he's not as bad as some of the Neoplatonists that believe in a complete uh, recapitulation of creation in regards to everybody being saved. This is an origin doctrine uh, that is con condemned as a heresy. For example, the demons and the devil, Satan, are not going to be saved uh, at the end of time because they've already transgressed God's will inside of eternity. Um, Origen believed that everybody, everything was going to be brought back to God into complete unity. And so he is sort of straddling two worlds, one of the Neoplatonic world, the other one is this Christian world. And as an Orthodox Christian, I would argue that he does misread St. Maximus um, and Gregory Nyssa to a degree uh, because he didn't have the full context of Orthodox theology. So his whole thing is he's building this whole framework upon St. Augustine, St. Maximus, uh, we would say St. Dionysius as Orthodox, although contemporary scholarship would say pseudo Dionysius, St. Dionysius and Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory of Nyssa, um, and really just the Cappadocians, generally speaking. So the Cappadocian fathers who aren't, if you're not familiar, that would be St. Basil the Great, uh, St. Gregory Nanziansis or St. Gregory the Theologian, and then St. Gregory of Nyssa. And so those three theologians are considered the Cappadocian fathers, and they have a great influence upon John Scotus. So, um, I want to, we got so much, look, just, just for the notes, like, let alone reading this whole, this whole book, which is, um, medieval philosophy, right? So it's incredibly, uh, it can be perceived as incredibly dry. He's talking about ontology. It is interesting though. This is a, this is a very interesting historical document because it would go on to give great uh, influence upon the Hegelians. And I'm going to cover all this stuff here in a few, but look, I got these notes. I got these notes. And I got all these notes just over this book. And then we're going to read actual sections of this book. OK, so I don't know how long we're going to be here, but it's probably going to be a minute um, for today's stream. So before we get into any of that, just want to take care of some quick announcements. The first one is a major thank you to Jeffrey Ivy for the sponsoring of today's stream. Thank you so much, brother. I truly, truly, truly do appreciate that. Um, and then. I wanted to say that I got my Montanica speech. So my Montanica 2023 speech, I just got that. It will be uploaded up on the website tomorrow. So if you guys would like to have access to that, along with a bunch of other exclusive video content, please become a website member. I would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate that. And so let me uh, share that with you guys real quick. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Okay, so if you uh, would greatly appreciate if you guys became a website member, there's three different memberships available. Let me share that in the right now. There's that. And um, we got the fitness membership. We got the premium members membership. If you guys are able, I highly, highly, highly recommend to become a premium member. We have these private conversations twice a month in a Zoom meeting. I'm telling you, they are phenomenal. And it's a great, great group of guys all around the world, by the way. And so if you would like to participate in some of the conversations I have on this channel live, do live streams, but then more privately amongst like-minded people from around the world, different age groups, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a lot of fun. And so if you sign up for a whole year, you'll get two months free, two months free. And so I highly recommend that. Also, if anybody would like to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one session, you can do so with this link right here. I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, we'll be getting back into some of the one-on-ones next Wednesday. Today was a research day because you know what? My fiance is flying in tomorrow. And so I needed to get everything done today because tomorrow I got a lot of stuff I got to get done. Um. Also, again, a major thank you goes out to Jeffrey Ivory for sponsoring today's stream. I did, he definitely put me to work uh, doing, doing this stream. But um, if you have a topic you would like to sponsor, please sign up for a sponsored stream. I would greatly appreciate that. It's another fantastic way to help out the channel, the program, my work. Um, and again, it's just another good way to support me. Also, we are on the march to 20,000 subs over here on Church of the Eternal Logo, so I'm really excited. We're about halfway there. We're on our way to 19.5 thousand, so very, very close. Um, 
And so I'm really excited for that 20,000 uh, subscriber stream that's going to be coming up. Also, I want to let you guys know another way to help me out is if you can go to orthodoxdepot.com and use promo code CODAL. There are tons of great items over there. If you're looking for icons, prayer robes, necklaces, um, you know, maybe they don't have what you're looking for, but maybe they do. And you can get 10% off all products and you help me out and you help out an, a good Orthodox company here in the Midwest uh, that is trying to service your Orthodox needs. So please, um, if you are looking for something, just check out Orthodox Depot and see if they have what you're looking for. I'd greatly, greatly appreciate that. Okay. Now, let's get into today's topic. It's going to be a deep one, so put on your thinking cap. So we're going to be talking about John Scotus Irigina, an Irishman, an important Irishman, an Irishman that was one of the only Latin scholars that could translate Greek in the Carolingian Empire. So this is the, so let, let, let's, let's move slowly here so we can introduce our gentleman today. And so here's John Scotus Irigina. Now, we're not going to be using a lot of Wikipedia. I have my own notes here. But just so you guys have a framework, uh, he's referred to as John the Scot, uh, John the Irishman. And this is not to be confused with um, John, uh, the other John Scotus of much later in history. That's like the 1300s. So he is a... Theologian, poet, the early Middle Ages, Bertrand Russell dubbed him the most astonishing person of the ninth century. Uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy states he's the most significant Irish intellectual of the early monastic period. He is generally recognized to be both an outstanding philosopher in terms of originality of the Carolingian era and of the whole Latin philosophy stretching from Bothius and Anselm. Um, he has a number of works. The best uh, known today is having the, again, the division of nature, also known as paraphysion. This is what we'll be reviewing today. So we'll be giving a bit of an overview of his entire worldview, some of the Orthodox Christian influences, because that's what makes John Scotus unique. He was one of the only people to translate Greek. So he has this uh, incredible influence by bringing in doctrines of theosis, uh, re re recapitulation, logos logi distinction. Um, the sort of apophatic theology of Nyssa and St. Dionysius. So very interesting man in regards to the historical context he existed in. Uh, the Paraphysion, which has been called the final achievement of ancient philosophy, a work which synthesizes the philosophical accomplishments of 15 centuries. The principal concern of division of nature is the untold form of physis, which John refers to as all things which are and which are not, the entire integrated structure of reality. Neurogena achieves this through a dialectical method elaborated through exitus and reditus, the interweaves, the structure of the human mind and reality as produced by the logos of God. Now, that logo should be capital L, um, but of course it is Wikipedia. Neurogena is generally classified as a Neoplatonist, though he is not. he was not influenced directly by such uh, pagan philosophers. Now that I have seen some scholars have debated how much of the Neoplatonism he was aware of or influenced of. Um, it's a debate, so we're not really sure about like Plotinus and Amblichus. Um, but he certainly, his, his goal was to blend this sort of Neoplatonic philosophy with Christian theology. And so in a ways that if you were a true Neoplatonist, he would say a lot of things about the Logos, about Jesus Christ, even about uh, human nature and stuff that the Neoplatonists maybe wouldn't agree with. But then from an Orthodox Christian perspective, he also is going to be way more rationalistic. So when we get into his doctrines of theosis and how he interprets Maximus, it's going to be a lot about a sort of meditating and contemplation, a sort of uh, a, a, medi a rational meditation on uh, what he calls the primal causes. These are really just the universal categories. Again, what, what St. Maximus calls the logi. And so what he's trying to do is really talk about, like, uh, again, I use the metaphor of dog category versus all the various dogs. He is very much interested in the categories, what he calls the, the primal causes, or what uh, St. Augustine calls the eternal reasons, or what St. Maximus calls the logi. Now, as Orthodox, we use the language of Maximus because that is more consistent with a Logos theology in regards to Orthodoxy. But 
John Scotus, for his Division of Nature, the first chapter. Okay, so this book, this book is divided into five books. Technically, the fourth and fifth book were supposed to be a book together, but the first book is really interested on discussing the transcendence of God's being. It's and again, you can see that apophatic emphasis again from Pseudo Dionysius that he's a, he's again the apophatic, the, the negative theology, he's beyond categories. And so he uses language, and we're going to read some of it, a lot about how God is being and not being. God is the primal cause of all causes. And at the same time, he, his being, he calls it super essential or super essence or super being because it's a being beyond being. And this is really what he's trying to hit at for the entire first book is on the transcendence of the essence of God. And he argues that the essence of God is even unknowable to God. Um, and, and, and so the, the contemplation on essences, the contemplation on the Logi, the divine principles, this for him is how man is a mediator between the created world and the creator. And the way that we bring these two worlds together is through the mind. You see the platonic emphasis there, right? Where theosis from an orthodox Christian perspective is going to be much more bodily, much more heart focused, much more of a virtue. And this is where you see an emphasis for John the Scott on, on God's goodness, as opposed to a, a more traditional Christian orthodox perspective on God's love. Love really does not come up much, a whole lot in this book. Because again, that Neoplatonic presupposition is so focused on the rational apprehension of things. And he believes that man uh, occupies a very special ontology in regard to the created world. He is the fullness of the created world and then also being made in the image of God. But we, the way that we then participate in God's creation is not so much from the enacting of virtue, although I'm sure he would be okay with that and he would be for that. It's through rational apprehension. And this is a huge difference between, again, like uh, my conversation I had with uh, Bishop Maximus, the participatory theology of orthodoxy versus the propositional theology of the West. It's much more propositional. It's much more a logical, rational formulation of understanding. And this, as I said, is going to be a big break, a distinction between John Scotus and the Orthodox world. So for him, again, it's about correct understanding, correct articulation, correct categories. And this is why it's about the divisions of nature, because he believes what he's writing here is he's breaking down in book one, the transcendence of God's being. Uh, book two is more about primary causes, looking at then all essences, all natures, all substances, although he used substances in a, in a bit of a different different context than I would in regard to Aristotelian substance and essence being a bit interchangeable from my perspective. He uses substance in a different way, so we're going to try to use, avoid using that word. But for him, primary causes are the essences or the natures of things. And he's very interested in these as um, every essence then has an effect and that is then the created world. This, this is what we're experiencing. We're experiencing all these effects due to the existence of these essences. And for him, he's saying, look, all these essences are in the divine mind, the logos, exactly a platonic formulation, right? What, what does Plato talk about? Ideal forms, ideal forms. And his Neoplatonism, he's still so focused on the ideal forms and our rational apprehension of these ideal forms, which again, according to St. Maximus, we call these the logi, from an orthodox perspective. And so he adopts much of this worldview. Now, uh, John Scotus, uh, we, again, we don't know much about his life. What we do know is he had an incredible reputation as a scholar. He, was, he had a reputation of being incredibly learned, incredibly sharp. Obviously, he was one of the only people in the entire Carolingian Empire that could translate Greek into Latin. He, we know that he's from Ireland. We know that he's an Irishman. Um, we don't know much about his birth. We don't know much about his early life, and we don't know much about his death. There is a there's sort of a myth regarding John Scotus's death in the sense that um, he was so strict, he was so he was so uh, philosophical, such such a scholar that his own students stabbed him to death with pencils because of his continuous critiques of their ideas and their work. 
Now, that is a myth. Uh, I don't think, again, from my research, no historian actually believes that John Scotus died due to his students stabbing him to death with pencils. However, the point persists that he was he was a very erudite individual, and those who then studied under him probably um, were quite challenged by his criticism and critique. And that's why, again, as we read, he, he's a very prominent figure in that ninth century uh, again, Bertrand Russell, who not exactly were the most biggest fans of, considers him the most astonishing and potentially important person of uh, ninth century phil philosophy. Um, he was succeeded by Al, Al Soon of York as head of the Palace School of Aachen. He also translated and made commentaries on the work of Dionysius the Areopagite and was one of the few Western Europeans of his day who knew Greek, and having studied it in Ireland and the Byzantine Athens. A later medieval tradition recounts that Eregina was stabbed to death by his students at, at Malmesbury with their pins, although this may have been rather allegorical. It was. So um, what do I want to say about him? Oh, is um, So he, the general dates for his life is somewhere around the year 800 he was born. Somewhere around 877, he died. Again, we don't know exact details, so these are rough estimates. He could have been born a few years before 800 or a few years after 800. He was an Irish Neoplatonic philosopher, and, he, and he's very ins uh, insistent upon philosophy being the hermeneutic and the tool in which we then analyze faith. Because this is the big break, right, when we look at Christianity, is we have this faith and prophetic tradition of the Hebrews, the Old Testament. And we have this rationalistic tradition of the Greeks. What does rationalism mean? It means that the belief that human reason, human reason with correct understanding can come to know the entirety of the world, that you don't really need anything else other than reason. Now that is obviously contrasted with the Old Testament, which is all about revelation which is about prophecy, which is about this communication with God, okay? So this is a big break, and you can see his insistence where, where he appeals to the Greek culture over and over and over, and, and he uses the, this reference to St. Dionysius, to St. Maximus, to St. Gregory of Nyssa, even though for them as Greeks, their Greek Christianity is, is not as Greek philosophical as his Neoplatonism, if that makes sense. Okay, so like I said, one of the most important philosophers of the Carolingian Empire, one of the only Latin scholars who could translate Greek, one of his greatest influencers was St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Dionysius, St. Maximus, and St. Augustine. His book, this Paraphysion, and I'm going to get into more details here in a few, had a minor impact in France. So he wrote it, and it was almost, and modern scholars will generally say that it was potentially above the pay grade of many of his contemporaries that in a way he was he was very erudite and they couldn't really understand what he was writing or what he was trying to say so it kind of went over the heads of people it had a minor splash in france when he first wrote it but it really wasn't until a couple hundred years afterwards that it began to get re, uh, uh, revivified and so it was neglected until the 12th century he wrote it in the 9th century it wasn't until the 12th century that it was revitalized by other Neoplatonists who saw his sort of synthesizing of Neoplatonism with Christianity as an inspiration for them. It was condemned by a Catholic council in the 13th century. So the 1200s, we already were post the Great Schism. The Byzantine East and the Latin West is already split. There's already, uh, you know, great, great damage between the two churches. But the Catholic Church condemned his writings um, for a, a handful of reasons, which we're all going to get into here in a few. But it was a great influence upon other Christian Neoplatonists like Meister Eckhart and Nicholas of Cusa, uh, both of which read Paraphysion and took it as inspiration. Um, in the 19th century, in, it was also revitalized by Hegelians because those who saw Hegel in his Hegelian dialectic, the dialectic of the thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Well, he's also not exactly like that, but he is so dialectic. He is so dialectic 
that that's where I think he kind of misses part of the orthodox phronema in the sense that we're trying to collapse dialectics. And he's also trying to collapse dialectics, but he does it in a very traditional philosophical scholastic way um, that I think comes a little bit short of the true orthodox phronema of the heart, the noetic faculties of the heart. It's not very heart oriented. It's not even very virtue oriented. It's very, very much about your rational apprehension of God's created order and then acquiescing to that order. So certainly virtue is part of it. Following Christ is part of it. But for example, he believes um, like whenever when you're brought into the kingdom, he believes deification theosis to mean that when you're brought into the kingdom, you are basically the same thing as Jesus Christ that was here on here on earth. And so he he views deification as like once you get deified, once you and you get deified through your mind, it's about a mind process, about a rational apprehension of the world. He believes that what you do is when you get into the kingdom, basically, we're all just like Jesus Christ. That is not, again, how orthodoxy understands theosis. Theosis is becoming God by grace, which he would absolutely agree with. We become gods by grace by the enacting of God's uncreated energies. And even though he translated Maximus, he really doesn't have the same understanding of the uncreated energies as, as the orthodox worldview does. And so it's always about rational apprehension. And so he thinks that the final destiny of every human who makes it in the kingdom is basically to be synonymous with Jesus Christ. Now, another problem with his dialectics and his collapsing of the dialectics, for example, is he, he does not believe that there will be gender um, in the kingdom, which is, from my understanding, a heresy within orthodoxy. We believe that Jesus Christ, the incarnated God, was a man and still has male genitalia inside the kingdom. Now, we, when we get to heaven, we're not Muslims. We're not having sex. There's no need for that, right? We're not tempted by 72 virgins. That this is, this is kind of degenerate if we're talking about the presence of God. However, we believe in a gendered soul as Orthodox Christians. And so our hylomorphism, hylomorphism is a, is a term for how the soul gives form to matter. OK, and it's an Aristotelian understanding. Now, we don't believe as, again, Father Deacon, Dr. Ananias can speak more eloquently. We don't believe the exact same thing as Aristotle, but the Orthodox Church does understand the, the soul giving form to the body and part of the noetic faculties. Obviously, the noose is the eye of the heart, the eye of the soul, which, again, he, he doesn't. He has a more Western, um, a Western tripartite understanding of anthropology. It's the body, mind and soul. And in a way, these things are separate things. Where in the Orthodox, they're they're all together. You can't really separate these things. Um, he refuted one of the things he did do. He actually defended the faith against a heretic. Uh, he was a Saxon monk. His name was uh, Galtschok, and Charles the Bold and a few other people actually asked him to write a treatise refuting refuting this heretic who believed in a sort of twin predestination based on a misunderstanding of Scripture and a reading of Augustine. Eregina, then quoting Augustine, said, true philosophy is true religion. Again, philosophy is preeminent for him because it's all about a mind's understanding because Platonism is about the, the ideal forms, right? And where are we encountering the ideal forms? It's in the mind. And so the mind is most primary in how we engage with God in John Scotus's worldview. No one enters heaven except through philosophy, according to Irigina. See, you see this, not exactly orthodoxy, but you see he's sort of straddling two worlds. Division, definition, demonstration, and resolution lead to truth for Irigina. Again, and so division and analysis is basically his sort of dialectical method. So he always puts things opposed to each other. So like man is an animal and man is not an animal. And these things then cancel each other out through negation and signify how man is above the animal kingdom, right? Because you can't say a lion is an animal and a lion is not an animal. No, because a lion is an animal. But his point is that because of the Mago Day, because we're made in the image of God, man is an animal. Man is the fullness of creation. And then man being made in the image of God is also not an animal. Man, you, you could say he's angelic, but then you would say, but man is not an angel. And so his philosophy, as we read it, he's always negating it, right? Because this is how he collapses the dialectics in his framework. And so 
for him using dialectics, division and analysis, he can break down these categories and for him resolve them mentally, which is part of his spiritual ascension back to the ideal forms, back to God. He uh, So he argued against this predestination, uh, no predestination, because everyone is saved. Everyone is saved. And this is where he has, just reading his, his book, there is a point where he talks about how everybody's going to be saved, and then not everybody's going to be fully deified. It's, it, it was a little bit hard to understand, because at points it seems like it kind of contradicted. But this would be one of the primary criticisms, as I said, from like Origen and other Neoplatonic heretics, is they believed in the full recapitulation of creation, which we do too. As be, Again, this is St. Maximus. We do too. This is the cosmic mystery of Jesus Christ right here. But that is matter. That is the created world. And then humans who have a will made in the image of God, along with the angelic entities, demons, i.e. demons, they use their will to turn against the will of God. Those entities will not be saved or brought back to God. Again, the Satan will not be brought into the kingdom. The demons cannot be brought into the kingdom. And as Orthodox, the people who in this lifetime choose and willfully go against the will of God, they, without repentance, cannot be brought into the kingdom. And where at points when I was reading some of his stuff, it seemed like he's saying kind of like origin, all of humanity will eventually be brought into the kingdom. And that's a bit of a problem. Um, and so in 860 is when he translated Pseudo Dionysius. And in 867 is when he finished. So it took him, here's, I have all of St. Dionysius, the complete works right here. So it took him seven years to translate all this stuff um, into Latin from the Greek. And again, he was the only person in the Carolingian Empire that could do that. Strongly, strongly, strongly rationalistic, right? His whole thing is that the rational soul of man. Notice that emphasis, the rational soul of man, it's through our rational capacity and our understanding of the world. Rationalism is the idea that the innateness of reason allows us to accurately understand the world and the accurate understanding of the world can bring us closer and closer to God. Okay, that is part of the Greek philosophical tradition, which you can see he was wrestling with revelation versus reason. And this is one of the reasons this is one of the, the reasons why he was condemned is he views scripture as pretty allegorical. Very few times does he read scripture literally. Now, there are aspects and St. Maximus, or according to some of my research leading into it, St. Maximus influenced him in being able to read aspects of scripture literally. But when it comes to Genesis, when it comes to uh, various uh, points in, in Scripture, he reads it uh, very allegorically. And he also misreads the, again, the point where, where um, in Galatians, what is it, Galatians 3.28, where it says that there is no male or female in Christ. He takes this to mean that there are no males and females in heaven, and that Christ, again, isn't actually a male. He's sort of androgynous. Again, you see he's trying to collapse the dialectic like orthodoxy does, but he, he kind of smashes two categories together to do it. We would not promote that. We would say, no, Christ is fully man, fully God, and he has a full human body inside of eternity. That's what makes the salvation through Jesus Christ so important and so unique. So, Erigena's uh, cosmology then, his cosmology is important to understand this whole thing, is that the cosmos is a holy order. Therefore, again, through your reason, you need to understand this holy order so that you can move closer in your being, in your nature, to that like God. This is for him is theosis. You see, not the same thing. Now, he, he would absolutely believe in virtue. He would absolutely support virtue. But virtue and the enacting of these uncreated energies, like, okay, reason and logic, but then mercy, compassion, love, um, honor, glory. These things are not mentioned at all in regards to deification very much. It's all about reason. It's all about rational apprehension of the world. And so it's we then are the mediations. We are the medium point between the created world and God. And it is realized through the theophanies. And so this is a move that he makes. When we say theophanies today, we're not speaking about the appearances of the Trinity or God in the Old Testament. As Orthodox, when we talk about a theophany, we'd be like, oh, yeah, like the burning bush, like Christ, the logos. They're talking to Moses, giving him the law. 
That would be a theophany, right? Yeah, that's how we use it, not how he uses it. His framework, a theophany is an essence. A theophany is a primary cause. A theophany is a logi. It's a divine principle of creation. So for him, a theophany is the contemplation of like the category of dog nature, the category of oneness. It'd be the contemplation on human nature. This is a theophany. A theophany, because what he what he appoints as a theophany is that all this is in the mind of God, the logos. And so the logi then are basically like ideas of the logos. And therefore, their ideas we need through our minds to then contemplate those ideas so we can then have those ideas in our head as well. And this is then a theophany. Basically, you're able to look at essences or these categories or natures in the same way that God looks at them. This is his theosis. Um, so his cosmology, by contemplating the theophanies, remember, a theophany for him is not a theophany for us. A theophany for him is called a primary cause. For Augustine, it'd be called an eternal reason. Or for Maximus, it's called a logi, a divine principle of creation, the archetype, the category, the essence of something, right? And so by contemplating this order, the human can return back to God. It can return back to source. And so the fall for him is sin. It is death. But it's it's a sort of, uh, again, a masking of our noetic understanding. Not a, again, not one of the heart because he doesn't he doesn't put emphasis on virtue, but our noetic faculties of understanding how the world is existing and how it comes to be. And this is why, because he's so interested in the essences, this is why his philosophy is so ontologically oriented. Ontology is the philosophy of being, being. And that's what he's interested in, is contemplating being. And when you contemplate being, you're contemplating these categories, these major, major categories. That's why ontology and metaphysics always went hand in hand when you start looking at Heraclitus, Parmenides, all the Greek, uh, the ancient Greek philosophers. So let me say that again. Theosis for Erigena. The cosmos is a holy order where we as the mediation or the meditation or the mediatas is realized through the theophanies contemplating the theoria of these theophanies. This is the way in which humanity can come back to source. Erigena correlates theophanies with Maximus's Logi, divine principles, or Augustine's seminal reasons or eternal reasons. And, and so Augustine talks about a similar idea of, again, these essences as the uh, eternal reason for something, right? What, what is the reason that dogs exist? Well, it's the dog essence. It's dog nature. What is the reason that there are elephants? It's because there's an elephant nature. There's an elephant essence. Now, Mac Maximus calls that a logi. That's a divine principle of creation that coming from the logos. So, okay, I, I think I'm berating that. You guys get it. This includes a framework of the cosmic Christology, which man is a co-participant in the redemption of creation. And this is a huge point for him. And this is why humanity and mankind has such a unique position for him is because we, through the contemplation of the ordered cosmos, are actually completing the creation because we are bringing it back to God through our mind. You understand? Through the mental, rational apprehension, we are trying to make our minds like the mind of God. By understanding these essences, we can move it back to that which is like God. And, and by doing that, we, as the epitome of creation, is bringing the entirety of creation back to it which he, he would agree with, and that is all due to the incarnation of the Logos, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the incarnation of the Logos, the metaphysical structure that's underlying all reality. And so St. Maximus, I want to I want to highlight then a few points of how he influenced Erigena. Um, he provides Erigena with tons of vocabulary because there's so many words that Erigena uses. He prefers the Greek word over the Latin word. And he prefers Greek philosophy over Latin philosophy. Uh, he's kind of explicit about his preference and his appreciation for, the, for Greek philosophy. And so through Maximus, John Scotus gets new vocabulary, new ideas, and a new methodology, and a new framework for understanding Christ. But as I said, the cosmic Christ Christology 
is essential for his recapitulation through the rational apprehension of the world. The contemplation of nature and scripture, what he called theoria physique or physica, is read with right understanding. Scripture and creation become transparent to divine presence. He gets this from St. Maximus. St. Maximus talks about scripture and nature are two ways in which we can read and understand God. And this is where Maximus is highlighting that rational tradition of the Greeks, rational apprehension of nature can bring us towards uh, ultimate knowledge. But that's tied with scripture. And so he, he adopts this from Maximus. Erigena reads the operations of dialectics, as I said, division and analysis, into Maximus's cosmic Christ, therefore affording Erigena a logos logi ontology and becoming a dialectical framework for, of epistemology and ontology. Erigena believes contemplating nature returns creation to its divine source. Philosophical anthropology. And this, and I think this is a really good one. That because again, the role of you know in orthodoxy we, we say everybody's a priest, everybody's the theologian because theology, a theologian is somebody who lives theology, right? That's why I talk about his philosophical anthropology. His is like everybody's a philosopher. Everybody needs to be a philosopher. Everybody needs to rationally comprehend and meditate on the ordered world. And so I called it a philosophical anthropology. Man unifies creation with God by rational contemplation due to the logos incarnate redeeming matter. Here's how St. Augustine influenced Irigina. Um that uh, Irigina takes Augustine's teachings that correct reason can be trained by the liberal arts. Irigina does not read scripture as literally as Augustine. Like I said, he, he wants to really, he, he would prefer an allegorical interpretation of scripture, but believes Gregory of Nyssa allows him to read it more allegorically because obviously Gregory of St. Gregory of Nyssa is, is kind of, has a reputation. He's famous for his allegorical interpretations. Now, I think most people would also say that he also believed it literally. So there is a, as we say, a spectrum of the ways in which we can understand scripture. But, um, but really the, the way in which Augustine uses and understands the role of reason is a, where he then, uh, Irigina begins to root reason as part of like the Christian tradition, this sort of rational apprehension. And then the Cappadocian fathers, Irigina uses Gregory of Nyssa's Imago Dei for his philosophical anthropology. Man's essence is like God's. They are both ineffable. And so he has a very high elevated stature for mankind. Um, and he makes points, and we'll get into it, in book four and five, he makes points where it, it is incredibly a pantheistic worldview, where he basically argues man will, in a way, he merges with God, but he maintains a separation from God. He's not part of the Trinity, but you can see the influence of the Western tradition. He believes in a beatific vision. Orthodoxy teaches when we make it to the kingdom, we'll still have infinite choices because theosis, this ability through gra the grace of God to become more like God, if God is infinite and eternal, then it's an infinite process how we can become more like God. And that is then what we get to participate in in the kingdom. But we have still infinite choice, rational choice, where he believes that it's more of sort of a beatific vision. We get to stare and rationally apprehend God and you, in, when you're deified, you're basically in the same place of Jesus Christ. So the role of the Logos incarnate and how he, in, how he understands it is that what that did was allow mankind to occupy the same ontology as Jesus Christ once he reaches the kingdom. Not the same thing in orthodoxy. We believe, again, everybody's theosis, everybody's level of deification is different. And so there may be many people in the, in the kingdom and their, their assimilation through the grace of God to be more like God could be different. There's a spectrum. So maybe, you know, your grandmother was, you know, she lived her life in a way where she was much more like Christ than you were. But both of you guys, through God's grace and mercy, were able to make it into the kingdom. And so you get a, for infinity, become more like God. He says, no, basically, you're already the finished product once you make it. Okay. Now I want to get specifically, uh, we're going to move through important, important aspects of this book before we read it. 
So guys, smash that like if you're here. Um, again, a major, major shout out goes to Jeffrey Ivy. Thank you so much, brother, for sponsoring today's stream. We had a few super chats come in. I want to give a special thank you to Jesse uh, Marasco. Throws in 1478. Says, keep up the good work, my friend. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. I see you in the in the live chat. God bless you, brother, and thank you very much for your support. And another one came in from BMX 1966. Throws in ten dollars and says, "Good day, DPH. Your last vid on modern counterculture was awesome. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much, BMX 1966, for your two super chats. I really, really appreciate that, man. Thank you very much. Um, that looks like that does the super chats. If you'd like to support the stream, please super chat using either the Streamlabs link or YouTube. I would greatly appreciate that. Okay, so now let's get into this book and start moving through it. You kind of have an understanding of what John Scotus is up to. So Paraphysion is essentially a Christian Neoplatonic Summa. It is the ultimate, the ultimate bringing together of Neoplatonic philosophy and Christian theology. And because he could study Greek, it straddles both the Latin ideas and Greek ideas regarding Christendom and theology. Book four labels his enterprise as physiologia. It's a physics it's a theology, it's a philosophy. So what he believes he's doing is he's he's bringing together for his time in the ninth century the understanding of physics, the physical world, his understanding of theology, the study of God, and philosophy, the study of wisdom. And philosophy is bringing theology and physics together. And this is what he believes he is doing. And so he has four divisions of nature. This is huge because obviously the whole book's called on the divisions of nature. He has four divisions of nature. And it goes something like this. The first division of nature is that which creates and is uncreated. Well, what, what creates is an, and is uncreated? God, obviously. So this first division of nature is God, that which creates, but which is uncreated. The next division of nature is that which creates and is created. These would be the primary causes, the, the platonic ideals, the logi, the eternal reasons of Augustine. These create and are created division of nature. Okay, this is a huge, I, I don't know if I, I don't know how I'm coming across right now, but this is an important understanding for how he's going to work through his philosophy. And so the third division is that which is created, but does not create. And these are temporal effects. These are, um, so for example, for he would argue, yeah, okay, the elephants reproduce and have more elephants, but the elephants that you can touch, he would argue, are the temporal effects of the primary cause, meaning elephant essence, elephant nature. The, the temporal effects of that nature is that we have elephants in the world, temporal effects inside space and time, right? This is the third division of nature. And then the fourth division of nature is that which is neither created nor creates. And this is his non-being or nothingness idea, which um, is kind of tricky. So um, his... The fourth division is that which is neither created nor creates. And for him, he argues that the first category, that which creates but is uncreated, and that which is not created nor creates, both of those are God. And he's highlighting, what he's trying to do is highlight that God is both the beginning, the primary cause of all things, and it's the telos. It's the end point of all things. That's the point of it. And so it's a, not a typical Neoplatonic hierarchy because he's obviously a, appropriating a lot of uh, Orthodox and Christian theology. So two and three is the unity of cause and effect. For him, cause and effect, all causes are the essences, the natures, the, the larger categories. All effects then are those which we see inside the created world. Those are the effects. That is the nature for him. This is, if you want to understand the reality of cause and effect, it's understanding the distinctions between these primary causes and ideas and the temporal effects which we see in the world. And then the end points of the beginning point of history and the end point of history, that is God. So nature is a dialectical coming together of being and non-being. Let me say that again. Nature is a dialectical coming together 
of being and non-being. Frankie D throws in a super chat. Shout out to Frankie D he throws in 499. He says, Hey bro, this is some great content. High level, high IQ stuff, man. Really love this college level breakdown of these philosophers. Thanks, bro. God bless. Well, thank you so much, Frankie D. God bless you, man. Thanks for hopping on yesterday. And thank you for all your support, brother. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I don't know how it's coming across because this is sort of highfalutin philosophy. And we're talking about the medieval period. And so that's why we can see this ontological emphasis, this, this emphasis on sort of understanding the nature of being. This is uh, this is sort of indicative of the medieval period there. Um, so um next point or, or late antiquity i guess you can say the ninth century it depends on how you divide your timeline i guess we could say late antiquity um then he has five modes of being five modes of being and these are number one things accessible to the senses things not accessible to the senses and so he says things that you can sense things that you can touch or or, or, or no let me say it things that you can uh sense have existence, things that you cannot sense do not have existence. So this is a breakdown, again, a breakdown of being. Being and non-being has to do with its relationship to your senses. Number two, and then so there's number two is orders and differences of created natures. Orders and differences of created natures. If one level of nature is said to be, then orders above or below are said to not be. If humans exist in a certain way, angels and animals do not exist in that way. That's what he's trying to say. So um, orders and differences in created natures, right? These are the primary causes. These are the ideas. So he's saying, okay, there's all these primary causes, elephants, humans, flowers, trees, right? But what, however, if, whenever you look at one of those essences, one of those natures, Anything above it or below it does not operate in the same way. It makes sense. That obviously makes sense. If we look at human nature, what would be for him a nature above human nature would be angels. Angels exist in a way that's not the same way that humans exist. If we look at animals, animals exist in a non-rational state that's different than the way humans exist. That's order number two, the mode of being. Number three is actual things being have effects versus potential things are still contained in their causes. So actual things are effects in the world. So actual things and effects, they would be like actual thing and effect would be a tree. It's an actual effect. The nature or essence of acorn trees or, you know, cherry trees, there's still potential that is non-being. So that which is still rooted in the primary cause, that still has potential. That has not come to fruition. Therefore, it doesn't have full being. Number four, things contemplated by intellect alone exist. Those caught up in the generation and corruption do not truly exist. Now, we see right there, we can already see a Neoplatonic move he's making on that fourth nature of being because he's, he's pointing to the ultimate nature of reality as mental. It's this divine mind. Again, getting back to Plato, getting back to Neoplatonism, this emphasis on the mind, the mind, the mind. And so he's saying things that are contemplated by the intellect, those alone truly exist. Now, we were talking about being. Obviously, he's saying created effects exist, but they don't truly exist. They don't truly exist like the primary causes exist. And those in which are, are caught up in the generation and corruption of the physical world he says those don't truly, truly exist, meaning meaning truly exist in an eternal sense. Because for him, these primary causes are eternal, although they're created. So uh, they're they're created, but they have a they have a they they lack temporality in the same way. And then number five, those sanctified by grace are said to be, while sinners who renounce the divine image are said not to be. And this is where something I really like what he talks about, because I've talked about this too, about the NPC, losing the image of God. Now we all are given the image of God. And we're all given image and likeness like God, but we can, through our sin, through our rejection of God, sort of become less and less like him. We can become more of an automated person. Again, the NPC, somebody who's 
emotions, their ideas, everything is already given to them. They're not really autonomous. They're not really there. They're not really human. They're not really like God, meaning free will, rational capabilities, participation in logic, the pursuit of truth. This is what a real person is doing. This is what somebody who's awake is doing. So a sinner, a sinner is not pursuing these things. And so a sinner, he says, is renounced the divine image and is said to no longer be. And so that's where he sees sin leading to the death. Sin equals death because sin equals the loss of the image of God. And therefore sin equals somebody becoming or, or moving towards the lack of being. They're said not to be. Okay, next section, the attributes of God. He gets into attributes of God in book one. And he says that book one really focuses on the transcendence of God, the transcendence of God. And he talks about that Aristotelian categories only apply to creation. And okay, that makes sense. God is unknown even to himself. And so I, this is where one, I'm not, I'm not as astute with all the church fathers to really make an opinion on that. I know that he he's getting this from a line from St. Maximus in the Ambigua, which he translated. But he, he says a lot in book one about how God is even unknowable to himself. Because God's super essential being, as he highlights, is so infinite and eternal that therefore if it is infinite and eternal his being it can't be circumscribed therefore you can't actually rationally come to a full conclusion about it you can't rationally circumscribe it with your mind neither could god because his nature doesn't have an edge to circumscribe that that was his argument you can see somebody rationally getting to that point so he says god is unknown even to himself and God's ignorance is his highest wisdom. This is where I really felt uncomfortable with talking about God's ignorance. But he says this specifically, that God's inability to fully know himself is part of sort of his mystical dimension and his wisdom kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't like that one. Um, so, but this is one in, in book one, he's going on about some of the attributes of God. And so God is totally transcendent, so, so transcendent, beyond, beyond any conception. That's why we need the logos. Agreed. He says, Aristotelian categories don't do us no good because those are only for the created world. And therefore, to understand God, we have to move beyond it. And therefore, he's all about St. Dionysius and the apophatic approach to Godhead, the apophatic approach to theology, negative theology. And so then he talks about God being unknown to himself and God's ignorance being his highest wisdom. Now, creation as a divine self-manifestation. And so we can see he's using this Neoplatonic language regarding emanationism. And he's trying to hedge his bet. He's trying to be on both sides of the, the aisle there. But he says the act of creation is self-manifestation. And I don't like that. And, and he makes points, obviously, he's highlighting the separation between the essence of God and the essence of creation, one's created, one's uncreated. We just got, that's the first division of nature, right? But um, I did not like how he kept articulating that the act of creation is self-manifestation. Now, certainly, because he doesn't use energies, and he, he never uses the language of like the energy essence distinction, we would say... The act of creation is good because it is imbued with the natural energies that are natural to the nature of God. And therefore, we can know God to a degree, one, number one, through revelation, number two, through the through aspects of his created world. But we wouldn't say it's self-manifestation. That is a very Neoplatonic way to word it in regards to a sort of emanationist understanding of creation. He says, the word creates all things and contains all primary causes. We would agree with that. Absolutely, 100%. I would agree. The logos creates all things and contains all the primary causes, the logi. For, for again, Augustine, the eternal reasons, the seminal reasons. Those are the primary causes, the natures, the essences of things. And those are all housed back in the logos. Agreed. We absolutely agree with that. Book three, he starts to talk about God and creatures are one and the same. And this is it. it 
I, I, I saw moves he was doing, but again, it just felt a little uncomfortable from an Orthodox perspective. He says the creature by subsisting in God. And so what, what does he mean by that? We're contingent entities. The subsistence, the perpetuation of our existence is due to the willfulness of God. He argues because he has a very pantheistic framework that God is subsisting, that, that in a way, God is working through us in the subsistence of our existence. And I don't totally disagree with it, but he says the create the creature by subsisting in God, God by manifesting himself creates himself in creation. I didn't like that because he wasn't just speaking specifically of the incarnation. If he's talking about the incarnation of the logos in Jesus Christ, agreed. God presents himself. If you want to use manifestation, although I don't like because it's so much close to emanation, but God puts himself in creation through Mary, right? Through the willful participation of other people. But the creature subsisting in God, God, by manifesting himself, creates himself in creation. That seems like it's beginning to cross a category that, a, that an Orthodox Christian wouldn't, have, wouldn't really jive into. It would be good for a Neoplatonic worldview, but not a truly Christian worldview. And so he says, God is the essence of all things. And he, the way he's arguing this, and where, and where, okay, I can agree, because what he's arguing there in book three is that all these primary causes were created by God, and yet they're all rooted in the logos. And so all the essences of everything is still in God, and it's created by God. And therefore, God is the essence of all things. But, agreed, but the logi, these divine principles of creation, these created essences, are we again we and through our orthodox energy essence distinction always continuously maintain a separation between created things and the essence of god and so this would be too close to bringing god's essence into a created context it feels a little uncomfortable the next section that i wanted to point is that he's talking about the primordial causes primordial causes book two is mainly focused on primary causes Again, these are these created essences and natures. And so he says, these are logi. These are for Augustine, the eternal reasons. These are for Plato, the ideal forms. They are infinite and they are theophanies. So again, highlighting that the logi, he calls those theophanies, not scripture. Because again, for him, scripture is very out allegorical. Um, and so he says they're infinite, which again, another thing, it's like, how could created essences be infinite? That seems again, like it's pushing up against a category that doesn't seem to be truly, uh, uh, truly there. So um, he says uh, a cause is not a cause unless it produces an effect. Eternal causes produce eternal effects. Okay. And so he's arguing then that the eternal cause of like human nature, the primary cause of human nature, human nature, a logi rooted in the logos, because of God's recapitulation, because of the incarnation of the logos, it's all going to be brought back to God, he argues. And therefore, if people, if humanity is going to participate in creation for eternity, well, then that must be an eternal cause. But he says that it was created. So, and it seems to me like we're, we're a little off there, but that's where he lays out in book two, the created effects, created things are located spatially and temporally. God created the corporeal world for the fall. It's an emanation. And this is where you can see the explicitness of his Neoplatonism. Cause he's saying the created world is an emanation from God or earlier. Um, I think in book one, he says it's a, it's a manifestation of God. Um, so then he goes on to say the physical body is not essential to human nature. And you can see again, another platonic move because matter is less than non-matter matter is less than the, the transcendent, the, the incorporeal, right? Because where is your mind? If mind is the basis of everything, where is your mind? Your mind doesn't have a physical, a physical presence to it. Therefore, non-physicality and that's where he gets into when you're resurrected you have a spiritual body he's referencing scripture agreed but he keeps going into the spiritual body has no gender the spiritual body is not going to have sexual organs the spiritual body 
then is more primary to human nature. He argues that Adam and Eve before the fall had spiritual bodies, um, which I don't, I then me just look, I had to go back and just make sure just to double check because of everything you're saying. Adam and Eve were created before the fall. Yeah, we know that. And God specifically tells them in Genesis one to go multiply. Right. So before the fall, God has already basically um, granted male and female the proclivity to procreate and, 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 you know, bring forth fruit, multiply. That's before the fall. So I did, it's like, I, I don't, I can't follow him there. Then this androgyny, this emphasis on androgyny and sort of the androgynous anthropology of man, this non-sexual state doesn't make any sense. Even though you can see the Neoplatonic move for androgyny though. And so he says the physical body is not essential to human nature. At the end of time, the corporeal world will be absorbed into the divine mind, which we do agree in the sense of Christ's second coming, but the new Jerusalem is going to be physical. And so you see, he's kind of reluctant to appreciate the physicality. Now, he certainly appreciates physicality much more than another Platonist or middle Platonist or a neoplatonist. But he still is kind of has reservations about physical matter, physical existence. Um, and so he says creation from nothing. Book three is about two types of nothingness. The highest nothing, this is God's non-being through the excellence of his nature, meaning it's so beyond contemplation, it's almost non-being. And then lowest being is unformed matter, and it's nothing through privation. Then he gets into the return of all things, book four and five, originally intended to be one book. It's natural for effect to return to their causes. So it's natural for all the elephants to return back to the category of elephant nature, elephant essence, right? He says corporeal things move to the incorporeal, the finite moves to the infinite, and the temporal moves towards the eternal. Um, the human mind will achieve unification with the divine through rational apprehension. Human nature will return to the true idea paradise for him is the perfect human nature in the mind of God. That's why, therefore, Jesus Christ is that perfect human nature. And that's why for him, we're all basically going to exist as like Jesus Christ in eternity, which we would not accept. Hell for him are people trapped in their own fantasies, and it's a deprivation of the vision of God. Because for him, Eternity is basically you get to be like Jesus Christ, but you're not Jesus Christ, but you get to then stare at the beatific vision for eternity, a very Catholic doctrine. And so the return is where the elect achieve deification and deification is becoming like Jesus Christ to the, to the fullness of that, a perfect human nature, he says. So human nature, he gets into books four and five, contain his anthropology. The bifurcation of sex is due to the fall. Androgyny is an ideal state, no male or female in Christ, even though, as I said, Adam and Eve both have sexual genitalia and are told to procreate, be fruitful and multiply before the fall. And orthodoxy has condemned the idea of an androgynous Jesus Christ because that would negate the fullness of his humanity and the redemptive work of his incarnation. And so... Um, he says androgyny is the ideal state, uh, employing dialectics in book four. He states that man is both animal and not animal spiritual and not spiritual human nature is the mediator between divinity and creation. Man is higher than the angels. Man is like God. He knows that he knows that he is, but he can't comprehend the fullness of his essence because of the Imago day. So when he talks about how God can't circumscribe his own being, and therefore he's unknowable to himself, which I don't really like. I don't like that framework. I don't, I didn't like him talking about God's ignorance was, was part of his wisdom, but he gets into the idea that human, um, that, um, because man is made in the image of God, the Imago Dei, he also can't fully circumscribe his own essence. And so the contemplation of human essence and nature is a way to elevate oneself through this ascension, this theosis, this deification process. Man is higher than the angels. 
which obviously God became a man. He didn't become an angel. Now there's different ranks of angels, and he's going to be very familiar with that because Pseudo Dionysius has the celestial hierarchy, which he translated. So he's going to be very familiar with the different ranks of the holy angels. But he highlights again that God had to become a man, physical man, to recapitulate the cosmos, to, to sanctify matter, to bring it all back to him at the end of time. And so human nature shares in infinity, he claims. Perfect human nature knows all. And that's another thing. So when you get into the kingdom, your deification is that you're basically going to be like Jesus Christ in the sense that you'll be a deified man and you'll rationally know all. You'll know all the reasons and all the causes and all the effects of the entirety of history. And that's what's going to make you like God and like Jesus Christ. So perfect human nature knows all, he says. Eregina is a pantheist for collapsing the difference between creation and God. And this is one of the places where he was condemned in that 13th century council, as I mentioned, because they said, hey, you know, it's kind of nice what you're doing, but it sounds like you are you keep bringing God and blending the category of created world and God. And he does because of this, uh, this understanding of these primary causes. And so it was condemned. And so he's much more pantheistic than we would like. And humans are separate from God in paradise, but will be perfer perfected human nature exactly like Christ. And then God fully manifests himself in man, he argues, and Eregina believes in a sort of mystical humanism and not an orthodox anthropology. So, you know, repentance is not a huge theme of his philosophical work. Because, again, it's Neoplatonic. It's incredibly rationalistic. It's focused on rational apprehension. The idea from, an, if you read an Orthodox saint, yeah, Maximus will get into a lot of these categories. That's where he's getting them from. But it's about repentance. It's about your heart. It's about the way you act. It's about how you treat people. It's about all these other things. Again, embodying the virtues, embodying the uncreated energies of God. He's not getting into any of, this, any of that stuff. And so it's sort of a mystical humanism, a mystical, rational humanism. And Irigina in book four is always trying to find infinity in everything. Human nature, creation without the fall, scripture, um, human learning, all these things he would say is infinite. That, that, that scripture has infinite truth. Cr uh, creation without the fall is infinite. And that when Christ comes, it's going to be infinite the way that it was intended to be. That human nature is infinite because it participates in the Imago Dei. And that human learning is infinite. This is what he says in book four. And then he and then he claims God is the infinity of infinities. And this line, God is the infinity of infinities, had a big impact on scholars that would later read him. Remember, I talked about some of the Neoplatonists in the 12th century that, that reread John Scotus Eregina and then the Hegelians. And so like the Hegelians, they love the idea that God is the infinities of, or he is the infinity of infinities. So, okay, that's the end of my notes. So what was that? An hour and 18 in the presentation. Now we can read, read some of his stuff and see what he's talking about. Let me just make sure we didn't get any more super chats. Uh, nope, doesn't seem like it. Okay, so let's continue here. Guys, smash that like for everybody who's still here. Okay, let's get into book one here. Um, okay, so in book one, so it, it, again, the, the entire book is a dialogue between teacher and student. So it, it's about like a student, it, it just says S and T. The student asks the question, he posits a question, and then the teacher begins to explain all this stuff. And so each book, you can see this dialectical process um, of where one person, you know, oh, I don't understand this, uh, you know, teacher, you say this, explain this. And so in book one, it's all about the division of nature. And it's really, really, really trying to emphasize the transcendence of the nature of God. Okay. So uh, this is the teacher. Well, then, the original distinguishing differentia of all things demands a clear-cut methods of interpretation. Of these, the first seems to be the way in which reason persuade, or persu persuades us that all things are subject to corporeal sense on the perception of intelligence can reasonably be said to have being. But all that 
by the excellence of their nature, elude not only the helion, i.e. every sense, but also intellect and reason, properly seem not to have being. They are correctly understood only in God, matter in the reasons and essences and all things created by him, and that it is as it should be, for he himself, God, who alone truly has being, is the essence of all things, according to Dionysius the Areopagite, who says, the being of all things is super being divinity. Gregory the theologian too affirms by many reasons that intellect or reason cannot grasp what any substance or essence is, whether it belongs to visible or to invisible creation. For just as God himself in himself beyond all creation is grasped by no intellect, so also usia, nature, essence, considered in the innermost recesses of the creation made by him and existing in him is incomprehensible. Besides whatever in every creature is either perceived by corporeal sense or considered by the intellect is simply some accident, incomprehensible in itself, as has been said of in uh, of any essence, by quality, quantity, form, matter, and some differentia, place, or time, we know what it is, but not that it is. This, then, is the first and highest method of division of what is said to have and what is said not to have being. Okay. So, again, uh, God's essence is the source of all things. Here is another section. We're right in the middle of... of um, which is uh, right in the middle of him talking and responding to a student. But he says, the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding. But if the cause of all things is removed from all things created by it, undoubtedly the reasons of everything in it, it eternally and unchangeably are utterly removed from everything of which they are the reasons. In my opinion, it would be true to state that there are in the intellects of angels, certain theophanies of these reasons. Remember theophanies for him are uh, primary causes, essences, natures, logi, i.e. the archetypal examples themselves. I believe that St. Augustine quite appropriately said that these theophanies were seen in angelic creatures before the generation of all things lower than they are. Let us not then be disturbed at our statement that angels see the causes of lower creatures first in God and then in themselves. The name God is applied not only to the divine essence, but also, as frequently in sacred scripture, to that way in which he knows himself, in some manner to intellectual and rational creatures, to each according to his capacity. This way is usually termed by the Greeks theophany, i.e. an appearance of God. An example is, I saw the Lord sitting, in other passages of this kind, in which man has beheld, not God's essence, but something made by him. It is not strange, then, if an angel is understood to have a threefold kind of knowledge. One is a higher knowledge of the eternal reasons of things, which in the manner just explained is first manifest in him. Next, what he receives from things above he entrusts to himself as if depositing it in a marvelous and ineffable memory. And it is said of reflected image of an image so that he can in such a manner have knowledge of things higher than himself. Who would dare to say that he has no inner knowledge of lower things? Being is correctly predicated, then, of what can be grasped by reason and intellect, and conversely, whatever surpasses all reason and intellect is likewise correctly to said to have no being. So again, that gets into that nothingness, no being category that he was talking about earlier, or I was mentioning to you earlier about his stuff. So then the student asked, um, but please give me a brief explanation of your inferences about this theophany. What is it? What is its source? Where is it? Is it formed within or without us? You are asking profound questions, in fact, the teacher says. I can't think of any more profound inquiry for man to undertake, but I shall tell you what I have been able to find on the subject in the books of the Holy Fathers who have ventured to discuss such matters. Please do, says the student. You ask what it is, what its source, and what its place. Yes, said the student. I find that a monk, Maximus, a divine philosopher, has discussed this kind of theophany with the greatest depth and subtlety in his explanation of the sermons of Gregory the Theologian. St. Maximus, of course, the great, the only. Theophany originates only from God and is brought about by the condens condensation of the divine word, i.e. the only begotten son, the wisdom of the father, toward the human nature created and purified by him and by the exaltation of human nature toward this word 
through divine love. By condescension, I do not refer here to the already brought about by the incarnation, but to that resulting from theosis, i.e. deification of the creature. Theophany comes about then from the condensation of God's wisdom to human nature through grace and from the exaltation of the same nature of wisdom itself through love. St. Augustine seems to agree with this meaning in explaining the apostle's words. He has become our justice and wisdom. His explanation states the Father's wisdom in which and through which all things have been made is created, but is not created, but it creates. Talking about God's nature. It is produced in our souls by an ineffable condescension of its mercy and joins itself to our intellect so that in some ineffable manner there's a kind of compound wisdom made from him as he descends to us and dwells within us from our intelligence, which is drawn up by him to himself through love and his formed in him. Similarly, he explains about justice and the other virtues that they are produced simply from a marvelous ineffable confirmation of divine wisdom in our intelligence. As Maximus states, divine wisdom descends through mercy as far as the human intellect ascends through love. This is the cause and substance of all virtues. Every theophany, therefore, i.e. every virtue, both in this life, which has, which begins to be formed in the worthy and in the future life of the man who will receive perfect divine bliss, is produced not outside a man himself, but in himself, and arises both from God and from men themselves." student says in summary then theophanies are made from god in angelic and human nature enlightened purified and perfected by grace they are produced by the descent of divine wisdom in the ascent of human and angelic intelligence which he agrees with okay moving on we're still in book one guys so so stay with me again it, you can see this is dense dense philosophical uh language from the ninth century so this is um yeah i i i would actually argue the 800s is late antiquity um, you could talk about the beginning of the middle ages, but, um, yeah. So here is another section in book one and, uh, it says, yes, this is the student. Yes, I do. And no things in my judgment can be more truly be opposites. And he says, pay closer attention then for when you achieve the insight that comes from perfect reasoning, you will observe quite clearly that when they concentrate on divine nature, these two ostensible opposites are not at all opposed to each other, but are harmonious in all respects. Let us take a few examples to clarify the point. Example given uh, says it is truth or, or the cataphatic says it is truth and apophatic counters and says it is not truth. These statements seem to involve a kind of contradiction, but when you examine the matter more intently, you find no discrepancy. The statement, it is truth, does not assert that divine substance is properly truth, but that it can be called by such a name by a metaphorical transposition from creation to creator. By such terms, the cataphatic clothes the divine essence, which is bare and lacks any proper designation. The way which asserts that it is not true, clearly and appropriately recognizing divine nature is incomprehensible and ineffable, does not make a flat denial about it, but rather denies that it is properly truth or it is properly so-called. The apophatic knows how to strip divinity of all its designations with which the cataphatic closes it. One closes it for by saying, for example, it is wisdom. The other strips it by saying it is not wisdom. One says then, it can be called this, but it does not say it properly is this. The other says it is not this, although it can be given a name derived from this. Okay. And then the student says, I believe that I see the matters very clearly now. Statements which formerly appeared to me to clash now are openly revealed as harmonious and not the least discordant when they are considered in reference to God. And so what does he do? He's trying to explain to the student the cataphatic and the apophatic theology. Again, book one is all about the transcendence of God's nature. And so he's trying to explain to this student the what he calls the super essential being of God is beyond cataphatic or positive descriptions. And this is where a lot of, I would say, a lot of the new age people or people just aren't philosophically sophisticated. They don't, they don't realize that calling God, God is love, God is love, God is oneness. Well, what you've done is you've put God in a box. You've limited, you've made the category of love bigger than God because God has to fit inside of it. And this is the problem with cataphatic categories and cataphatic descriptions of God is that it limits where if God is truly, if God's essence is truly transcendent, 
that's where apophatic theology, the negation, God is beyond knowledge. God is beyond reason. God, God is beyond love. God is beyond these things. It is not, uh, it is not right. It, it's the apophatic nature. It's the negation, which he's into. Okay. We're going to skip. I think I have one more for book one. Um, yeah, here's, here's one in book one. This is right in the middle of a ginormous section where he's going, um, and explaining something to the student here, but he starts getting into St. Gregory, the theologian. So I was going to read this section. If you now closely follow the tracks of St. Gregory, the theologian and his wise interpreter, Maximus, you will discover that usia nature essence in itself and all things endowed with being cannot be grasped at all by either sense or intellect. Its existence is therefore inferred from what may be called the attendant circumstances, place, quantity, and position. Time also is added to these circumstances. Within these, as though encompassed within certain boundaries, essence is known to be enclosed, so that accidents do not appear to be subsisting in it, for they are outside. Neither, on the other hand, do they seem to exist without it, because it is at the center around which time revolves and on all sides of which are stationed places, quantities, and positions. Some categories then are predicated about usia, and they are said to be uh, periokai, standing around, because they are observed around it. Some categories in usia are given in the Greek name uh, some <coughs> simbamata, uh, i.e. accidents, and they are quality, relationship, state, action, and reception of action. These categories are also understood outside being in other categories example given quality and quantity as color and body likewise quality and usia as invisibility and incomprehensibly in genre similarly relationship outside usia as father to son son to father for they do not come from nature but from accidental corruptible generation of bodies a father of course is not the father of his son's nature or a son the son of his father's nature but father and son are of one of the same nature no nature, moreover, either begets itself or is begotten by itself. Relationship is present in usia itself when genus is begotten by itself, or genus is related to species and species to genus, for a genus is the genus of a species, and a species is a species of a genus. State two is found both within and without usia, we say armed or dressed in reference to the body. And he continues to go on. But you see, this is pretty dense, dense philosophy. And this is why, again, the reception of this book wasn't <laughs> wasn't great in France in in the in the eight hundreds because it was kind of above people reading it. They you know the the ability he's he's referencing you know he has a full understanding of Plato or 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 what he could get his hands on. He certainly has uh, an understanding of at least the Neoplatonic framework. But Aristotle, um, he's read he's read all of Augustine. And so he's he's bringing forth a very in-depth philosophical analysis on these subjects, and that's partly why, again, he had such a reputation. Now, here is a section on book two. We're going to jump into book two now, where he's talking about the primordial causes. Remember, book two, book one, the transcendence of God. Book two, the primordial causes, these logi, the eternal reasons of things. And so he says here, and I'm just going to read a section because this goes on for pages. Um, uh, he says, And the primordial causes, as I have said in the preceding discussion, are what the Greeks called ideas, i.e. eternal species or forms, and unchangeable reasons according to which and in which the visible and invisible world is formed and ruled. They have therefore merited the name given by the Greek philosophers as a prototypa, an archetypal example, which the Father made in the Son and through the Holy Spirit divides and multiplies into their effects. They're also called the uh, poris, porismata, i.e. the predestinations, for in them whatever things are, have been, and will be made by divine providence were unchangeably predestined at once and together. Nothing arises naturally in an invisible and invisible creation except that Ha what has been preordained and given prior definition in them before all times and places. They are likewise commonly designated by philosophers as thelemata, i.e. divine wills. Since whatever God wished to make, he made in them primordially and causally, and whatever 
is to be was made in them before the ages. Hence, they are said to be the beginnings of all things, since everything sensed or understood invisible or an invisible creation subsists in participation to them. Talking about the essences, the logi, the natures, the eternal reasons. Everything that exists in the world subsists back into their primordial cause. They themselves are participation in the single cause of universal creation, uh, the sublime and holy trinity. And they are said to have being in themselves because no creature mediates between them and the single cause of all things. And while they subsist unchangeably in it, they are the primordial cause of other causes which follow them. As far as the extreme limits of all nature created and multiplied to infinity, I speak of infinity from the point of view of creation, not of the creator. For the end of the multiplication of creatures is known to the creator alone, because it is he himself and no other. The primordial causes then which the divine philosophers call the beginning of all things are goodness in itself, essence in itself, life in itself, wisdom in itself, truth in itself, intellect in itself, reason in itself, virtue in itself, justice in itself, salvation in itself, magnitude in itself, omnipotence in itself, eternity in itself, peace in itself, and all the virtues and reasons which the Father made in the Son at once and together and according to which the fabric of the universal order is woven from the highest things downward, i.e. from intellectual creatures where uh, who are closest to God after God, to the lowest order of all things in which bodies are contained. Okay, and it goes on. But you see, this is pretty dense stuff, guys. So if you're reading you're like, or you're hearing this, and you're like, what the heck is he talking about? That's okay. That's totally natural. This is, um, this is very in-depth philosophical language here. Uh, one foot out the door. Well, I'm glad you're still here, brother. Throws in $10 Canadian and says, thanks for the great streams. Well, thank you, brother. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you very, very much. One foot out the door. God bless you, man. Thank you very, very much. All right. Well, I will keep going here. I appreciate that one foot out the door. God bless you, bro. Um, so moving forward, we're still in book two here. Um, here's another section. Uh, this is a little bit shorter, but again, remember book two is all about the primordial causes. <clears throat> um, and so it says the, f it, oh, Theoria zones. Yeah, I'm getting like 90%, but it's fascinating. It is interesting because you're reading a piece of history. Again, what we're reading here is a man, an Irish man living in France, who is the only man who could translate Greek, who had read Maximus, uh, Nyssa, or the Cappadocians, St. Dionysius and Augustine, and was familiar with Aristotelian philosophy, was trained in all these things. And he's then creating a Neoplatonic synthesis with Christian theology. Now, do I agree with that? Absolutely not, because I'm a Christian. I'm not a Neoplatonist. You know, some of this stuff is heresy. But it is interesting as a historical example of this man, because this stuff is very... Um, forgotten. I know that uh Dr. Crispy Rothschild, <laughs> shout out to Do shout out to Crispy. He said that Irigina used to be on the 5 the 5 pound note in Ireland. So he he is famous as an Irishman and he was the most learned man in the Carolingian or at least the Charles the Bald in, in the court of Charles the Bald at that point in the in the uh Carolingian Empire. So it's a fascinating timepiece what we're reading. But uh but yeah, so I hope you guys are interested. Here's a small little section again from book two. Remember, book two is all about essences, pri primordial causes of things. He says, the first is the one who, by which he does not know evil because his knowledge is simple and formed by the only substantial good, i.e. himself. He alone is substantial good in himself, but everything else good is good by participation. Good by participation. I just lost my in him. God, therefore, is ignorant of evil for he if he knew evil, evil would necessarily be in the nature of things. Divine knowledge, of course, is the cause of all things with being. God does not know the things which have being because they subsist, but they subsist because God knows them. Divine knowledge is the cause of their essence. And hence, if God knew evil, it would be understood substantially in something and evil would be a participant in good and vice the wickedness 
and would be would proceed from virtue and goodness. But true reason teaches that this is actually impossible. The second kind is that by which God is said to be ignorant of anything except things of which he made and knows the reasons eternally in himself. He essentially possesses knowledge of those things over which he naturally has power. The third is that by which, as we have previously stated, God is said to be ignorant of those things which are not yet manifestly apparent in their effects as the result of action, but he does possess their invisible reasons created by in himself, by himself, known to himself. Okay, moving forward. Um, here he mentions uh, Nus and Usia, um, but for him, Nus and Oh, actually, no, no, that's just the student. I don't want I don't want to read the student. I only want to read uh, the teacher per se. Okay, we're gonna just gonna move skip forward to book three. Okay, book three now. Um, okay, what's the first one I got here for book three? Okay, here's this here's the student asking the teacher a question in book three. I willingly yield to these analogies produced by deep and careful reasoning. And I approve them as plausible. But before you turn to consider the effects of primordial causes, from which especially the first and only creative cause of all is usually designated, it seems appropriate to know their natural order. Up to this point, I think that they have been introduced in a confused and indistinct manner. In my opinion, it would be very helpful to those who seek perfect knowledge. Remember, perfect knowledge is this deification process for him, incredibly rationalistic. To be very helpful for those who seek perfect knowledge of them and of their effects, if first there is a lucid explanation of the natural order in which they were founded by the Creator, and so here goes the, um, here goes the uh, teacher, Saint Dionysius the Areopagite, the zealous investigator of divine providence, has arranged the series of primordial causes very clearly in his book on divine names. He declares that the first gift and participation in the highest good, which participates in nothing else since it is goodness in itself, is goodness in itself by participation in which anything at all is good. It is called goodness in itself because they itself, it participates in the highest good. The other goods, on the other hand, participate in the highest substantial good, not by themselves, but by it, which is in itself the first participation in the highest good. <laughs> Do you understand this? This rule is uniformly observed in the primordial causes, i.e. that they themselves, they are the primary participations in the single cause of all, namely God. Since indeed the first aspect of the highest and true nature is that by which the highest and true good is understood, and the second is that by which the highest and true essence is understood, essence in itself deservedly holds the second place among primordial causes, for since it is the first participation in the highest and true essence, all things after it receive being through participating in it and consequently are only good by it also existent. The third examination of divine natures is that by which the highest and true life is understood. Life is itself reckoned as third among primordial causes because it is created as the first participation in the highest and true life in order that all living creatures after it might be alive by participating in it. As a result, the good and the existent and living have being. The fourth speculation about this same nature is that by which the highest and true reason is recognized, since reason in itself is a participation in the highest and true reason, and to hold in its possession the origins of all rational creatures after itself, i.e., those of participant in reason. The fifth speculation about the divine nature deals with the highest and true intelligence, for it is the intellect which understands all things before they are made. Hence, intelligence in itself is recognized as the fifth in the order of primordial causes, for by participation in it, other things have understanding in our intellects, but it itself was created for the first participation in the highest and true intelligence. Woo! Okay, so again, a bit of a word salad there. And what he's trying to say is basically these primordial causes, these essences, again, they have their existence in God. And he's talking about this sort of cause and effect, uh, this chain of events here. As the first cause of all, 
which in which through which and in relation to which they were created is infinite so they too know no end by which they may be ex be bounded except the will of their creator you must note that the order of primordial causes again essences which you demand me in order to distinguish clearly a sure method of proceeding has been established not in the causes themselves but in speculation i.e in the highest of a mind that seeks them out and takes up the knowledge of them in itself insofar as it can and orders that knowledge in a certain way so that it can make sense some sure statement about them defined by pure intelligence the first causes themselves are in themselves one simple defined by no known order and unseparated from one another their separation is what happens to them in their effects in the monad while all numbers subsist in reason alone no number is distinguished from another for all are one and simple one and not a one compounded by, from many. Indeed, the whole multiplicity of numbers proceeds from the monad to infinity. But the monad is not made up of the manifold numbers proceeding from it as it were gathered into one. Similarly, the primordial causes which they are understood as stationed in the beginning of all things, the begotten word, logos of God, are a simple and undivided one. But when they proceeded into their effects, which are undivided, or I'm sorry, multiplied to affinity, they receive their numerous and ordered plurality. Not that the cause of all things is not order or setting in order, or that setting in order in itself is not numbered among the beginnings of things, since everything ordered has been set in order by participating in it. But all order in the highest cause of all and in the pr first participation in it is one of simple and distinguished by no differentiate for there are all orders are indistinguishable since they are inseparable one from which the multiple order of all things descends thus the order of primordial causes is established according to the judgment and the contemplating mind in so far as knowledge out of them is granted to those who discuss divine causes Woo. okay so a lot of stuff going on there. He again trying to highlight this relationship between the monad, the one, and these many forms of primordial causes, these essences, these natures, these categories. D Anna throws in 999. Shout out to D Anna. She throws in 999 and says, My favorite stream this year. Excellent. Thank you for your hard work to share this with us. And many thanks to the sponsor. Yes, many thanks to uh Gregory uh, or Jeffrey Ivy. I'm sorry. Uh, many thank you to Jeffrey Ivy for sponsoring today's stream. I knew that this stream wasn't going to be the most popular because it was going to be incredibly intellectual and philosophical, and those tend to not be the most popular streams. But I'm really glad, Deanna, that you're finding it, and this is one of your favorite streams of the year. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. Yeah, it's... um. You can see, so what we can we see so far? We can see this immense place on rationalism, the intellect, rationally comprehending and understanding these categories of creation, these, these primordial causes, how they relate to the effects, how they relate to the multiple expressions or manifestations of causes in the world. So here's, here's the next section, again, in book three. This is on page 141. Um, I'm going to read. We're going to start with the student here. The student has a question. Again, thank you so much, Deanna. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for your support. If you'd like to show some love, feel free to uh, send in a super chat. I do appreciate it. And uh, shout out to Bone Man 538. Woo! Bone Man 538 throws in $110. Says, thank you, brother. Well, thank you, Bone Man 538 uh jeffrey ivy sponsoring today's stream thank you so much bone man god bless you bro thank you very 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 much uh for that i truly do appreciate it man so uh thank you bone man 538 uh for sponsoring today's stream and helping um and helping helping me out so thank you very very much okay we're gonna read now this is on book three page 141 we're gonna read the section of the student and then we're gonna get into uh, the teacher's response, so you can see a little bit. Again, the examples are indeed quite ample in so far as the ineffable can be expressed by likeness, although it is actually removed from all likeness. But the likeness of our intellect, which you use as an example, differs, in my view, from what it is to illustrate in that intellect using matter created outside itself 
forms and adapts those chariots in which, as you say, it is conveyed in the sense of others. Divine goodness, however, outside of which nothing can, nothing has being, did not take that matter for its appearance from anything, but from nothing. But when I hear you say that the divine goodness created everything from nothing, I do not understand the meaning of nothing, i.e., whether it is the privation of all essence or substance or accident, or whether it is the excellence of the divine super essentiality of the divine nature. And here's the teacher's response. I should not readily concede that the divine super essentiality is nothing or that it can be designated by such a term of privation. Although it is indeed said by theologians not to be, they do not mean that it is not that it is nothing, but that it is more than being. How could the cause of all things with being be understood to be no essence when all things with being demonstrate that it truly is? And yet an understanding of what it is is not achieved by any evidence derived from things with, with being. If then, because of its ineffable excellence and incomprehensible infinity, divine nature is said not to be. It, is, it does not follow that it is absolutely nothing for the very cause of calling it not being, but super essential being. It is that true reason does not allow it to be reckoned among the number of things which being, because it is understood to be above all that has being and without being. So you see what he's saying. He's trying to highlight that, look, um, um, he's saying, look, the, um, the, um, nothingness thing that he was talking about, how God has like no being. He's trying to explain that when he says no being, he means that it's not in the same category of being an ontological reality as all, all these primordial causes, all, all that has being in the world. He's saying you can't say God has that same being because God's the responsible for the primordial causes that give being, being. Therefore, he says, God must have a super essential being, a even more transcendent being. That's what he's trying to highlight and all that stuff. And so I'm going to continue because the student and then he responds. So I'm going to do two more sections here. He says, this is the student. Then after hearing that, he says, how then should I interpret your statement that God made from nothing all things with being? Question mark. The teacher says, understand that existing things were made from non-existent by the power of divine goodness. Those things which had no being received it from nothing, for they were made because they had no being before they were made. By the term nothing, no matter is thought of, no cause of existing things, no procession or occasion, followed by the creation of those things which being followed, no thing, co-essential or co-eternal with God, no thing outside God subsisting by itself or derived from some source from which God, so to speak, took some matter or fashioning the world, but rather it was the name of complete privation of essence, or to speak more accurately, it is the complete, I mean, it is the term for the absence of all essence, for privation is the removal of a condition. How, someone might ask, could there be a privation before the state was brought into being. Of course, there was no state before all things with being received, the condition of its substance. So he's saying, again, what I'm trying to say, when you ask me, how did God create something out of nothing? That's why the teacher, he's saying, that's why I'm trying to tell you we can't, we can't ascribe the same being to the category of God because it's through God that anything has being. And God wouldn't give himself his the same sort of being. And so this is a super essential being. This is something beyond rational categories. And this there and there, therefore, because it's beyond being, it's non-being, because it's not the being that I'm trying to say all being has, if that makes any sense at all. First person Q throws in two dollars. Thank you so much, first person Q, for being here, man. And I do appreciate you becoming a member yesterday. God bless you, bro. Thank you very, very much. Okay, um, so then the student says, that same nothing then implies the negation and absence of all essence or substance, or rather of everything in universal creation. The teacher says that is true, I believe. 
Almost all expounders of sacred scripture agree that the founder of universal creation made from absolutely nothing, not from something, everything that he wished to be made. So God made the world from nothing. Creatio ex nihilo, creation from nothing. <clears throat> and so you see, he's bringing he's bringing that Christian framework because you know for Plato and everything, creation was eternal. Creation didn't have a beginning point. Um, and so the idea that creation had a beginning point is, is it was part of the biblical, the Jewish tradition, because, again, God made creation in Genesis. You see then Irigina here adopting that Christian framework for the Kratio ex nihilo, but then he maintains his Platonism by saying once Christ comes back, Creation will be redeemed, and then it becomes an infinite the way that it was intended. So he's saying, yeah, creation isn't infinite, but once God redeems it at the end of the world, or, or his, his, his incarnation redeemed it, but then once it's fully recapitulated at the end of the world, then it'll be infinite and eternal again. Okay, moving on to the next section here in book three. We're still in book three. Now we're moving to a, a whole different section. This is one where he's really getting into the logos and the word. I thought this was a really interesting, you know, how I am about the logos. So I had to incorporate this section. This is page 151 in book three. And he says, this is the teacher speaking. The reasons of all things, as long as they are understood in the nature of the word, I'm going to say logos every set times he says the word and the nature of the logos, which is super essential I judge to be eternal. Whatever has substantial being in God, the Logos, must be eternal, since it is simply the Logos itself. My inference, therefore, is that the Logos itself and the manifold and primal reason of universal creation are one and the same. We can also express ourselves this way. The simple and manifold primal reason of all things is God, the Logos. By the Greeks, it is called Logos, i.e. the word, the reason, or the cause. Hence, the words of the Greek gospel in Arche in Hologos can be interpreted in Principio in Verit Verbum. In the beginning was the word, or in the beginning was the reason, or in the beginning was the cause. Whoever offers any of these versions will not be deviating from the truth, for the only begotten Son of God is the Logos, the reason and the cause, the word. He is the word because through through him, God the Father said all things were being made. Or rather, he himself is the Father's speech, the divine word, and discourse. He himself says in the gospel, quote, And the discourse which I have spoken to you is not my own, but it is the discourse of him who sent me. Now, I'm going to continue here, but I want to highlight, and again, this is really novel because he's a Neoplatonist. And for all Platonists, in all Neoplatonists, the Logos is a demiurge, it's created. And he's taking the gospel of John and saying, you know what? No, the Logos isn't created. It's actually co-eternal with God, the, the Almighty. So this is a real move for him. Again, I'm just trying to provide context. As a Neoplatonist, this is a unique feature of this entire cosmology he's constructing. <clears throat> he himself is the father's speech. Okay. It is as though he were openly saying, I, the discourse of the Father, who have spoken to you, and not my own, but belong to the Father, who speaks in me and begets me from the hidden recesses of his substance, speaks in me and begets me through me, i.e. by begetting me, he is the reason, since he is the archetypal exemplar of everything visible and invisible, and he is therefore called idea, i.e. species or form in the Greek. In him, before the creation of the Father, saw all things to be created, which he, the Father, wished to be created. He is also the cause, since the occasions of all things subsist eternally and unchangeably in him. Since the Son of God is then word, reason, and cause, it is not uh, incongruous to say that the simple and in itself infinitely manifold creative reason and cause of universal creation is God's Logos. And so the statement would occur that God's word is simple and in itself infinitely manifold creative reason and cause of the universal creation. He is simple because the universe of all things is in him. It, it is one undivided and inseparable whole. This is where we talk about how the logos is the metaphysical basis of all reality. All of it is subsisting independent upon the logos. 
is what he's trying to explain in his own way. It is diffused to affinity through everything. And the diffusion itself is the subsistence of all things. It reaches in full force from one end to the other and beneficially arranges everything. So in the psalm, his word runs quickly. The prophet designates the sermo as sermo, the father's word, which runs quickly through all things in order that they may have being. His discourse through all things is the multiple infinite substance of all. Hence, St. Dionysius in his chapter on the perfect and the one says, it is indeed perfect, not only as perfect in itself and uniformly separated from itself and according to itself, the whole through the whole and the most complete state of perfection, but is also more than perfect according to the excellence of all things and sets a limit to all multitude. So the logos is that which also maintains the boundaries between creation and all things. Again, because it's the logos and the logi, the primordial causes that give the cause, the causal force for all temporal effects. So everything that has an existence finds its existence in the logi, which is rooted in the logos, which is then undergirding all of reality. It surpasses everything in itself, overflowing in a single ceaseless bounty, which is inherently beyond fullness and inexhaustible. It remains then universally and simply in itself, since all things are one in it. It reaches from one end to the other and runs swiftly through everything, i.e. without delay, it makes everything and becomes everything in everything. Again, that's why the logos had to become man incarnate. It is in all things and it pervades all things. It is everywhere and in all. You see, it 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 fully blows your mind that it, this this is the reality of the second person, right? So we we can agree basically with everything he's laying out here. While in it in itself it subsists as one, perfect and more than perfect and separate from all, it extends itself into everything, and the extension itself is everything. This is the apparent meaning of the cherubim, the name of the celestial essence itself. The sages of the Hebrews have passed down the tradition of the cherubim and means the diffusion of wisdom. One must subtly understand by this diffusion or extension, of course, of wisdom or however else one may express the infinite multiplication of the logos, the word, not a movement into things which had being before the word and wisdom of the father was diffused or extended or ran its course. Rather, its diffusion extension, of course, precedes all things and is the cause of all existence and is, in fact, all things. What man who considers the truth would believe or think that God had prepared for himself places through which he might diffuse himself when he is contained in no place, but is the commonplace of all things. Hence, the place of places is held fast in no place or he is believed to have prepared for himself spaces in place or in time through which he might extend himself or run his course, or he is free from all space and surpasses all times by his eternity. Or would you say, as even more incredible, that another first principle prepared for God spaces of all places and time or intervals of any quantities or whatever kind which he might fill by his diffusion or go through in his course of, or solidify by his extension. Okay, so what are we seeing here? He's talking about the diffusion of the logos into all things. As we move into, I think the next one I have is book four. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, I got one more for book three. Yeah, one more for book three. But we see, what's he doing? He began with the ultimate transcendence of God. Number two, then got into these primordial causes. Book three, he's, now he's laying out how all of nature is connected. All the created world finds its existence back in the logos, back in the second person of the Trinity. And then about, in book four and five, he's going to talk about how creation then is coming back to God. Don't you see the movement then of this, of this entire on the divisions of nature? Transcendence of God, primordial causes that God created how that relates to the created world, how that relates to the logos, how all those logi, those eternal reasons are in the logos, and the logos then pervades all of creation. And then through that, all of creation is going to come back to God in the recapitulation at the second coming, you see. Okay. So, um, okay, let's move into, uh, let's move into book four here. So book four and five were actually intended to be a single book, 
but uh, they were broken up. And um, these are really about how, again, God is bringing creation back to himself, how it all comes together. So, uh, okay. So let's see here. We're on page 223 if you're following and you have this book. So the student asked, how one and the same man then, according to the preceding argument, is both animal and not animal? He's talking about, so now Eregina, as the teacher, is trying to explain that um, man, like God, actually is many different things and they negate. So to say man is an animal is true. And then to say man is not an animal is also true because the Imago Dei, he's more than an animal. And so he's getting into this negation process, this, this, this sort of apophatic negation of things. And this is what the student is asking him about. How one and the same man then, according to the preceding argument, is both an animal and not an animal? Or how is he like an animal and then not like an animal? And is flesh and he's not flesh? And he's spiritual, but he's not spiritual. And how these opposing and contradicting conditions can be understood in an altogether simple nature, I do not see very well. This is the student. Now the teacher says, from what has already been said, anyone who examines the matter quite carefully will see with utter clarity that everything that seems to you contradictory is simplicity, is the simplicity of human nature is not, is not only not contradictory, but even thoroughly suitable. Wise men agree that a man is universal creation is contained. I mean, universal creation is contained in man. Man understands and reasons like an, 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 like an angel. He has sensation and governs his body like an animal. And hence all creation is understood in him. Of course, the division of all creation is fivefold. It is corporeal, vital, sensitive, rational, and intellectual. All these aspects are contained in man in every respect. The lowest part of his nature is body. Then comes the life contained in seed, which governs the body and which is under the domination or the dominion, I'm sorry, of senses. Next reason, which rules over the parts of the nature beneath it. The mind holds the highest place of all. Thus, human nature as a whole, insofar as that has a share with animals, is rightly considered an animal. Moreover, it has a share with them insofar as that it is a body and a life governing and, the, and a life governing the body and sense and a memory of sensible things that deals with the fantasia fantasies. But insofar as it is a participant in divine and celestial essence, it is not an animal, but participates in celestial essence by reason, by intellect, by the memory of the eternal things. You see, we're participating in God through our reason, through our intellect, through our memory. That is not an orthodox understanding of how we participate with God, but this is this is um, this is essential for how how this gentleman understands it, uh, Eregina. So you can see that Neoplatonic emphasis there. The con there consequently is a whole devoid of the nature of animal. It is made in God's image only in that in that part of itself which God addresses in the case of a worthy man. As St. Augustine says in book two of the city of God, he speaks to the part of man, which is better than the other parts of which man consists. And then which only God himself is better for since man was made in God's image, surely he is nearer to God who is above him in part by, by of himself, by which he surpasses his baser parts, which he has in common, even with the beasts. We must note, also, that even in this life, before everything of animal nature in man is turned into a spiritual and everything compounded is united into an ineffable simplicity, man as a whole can be, become both like an animal and spiritual. He can become like an animal merely by free choice, but he can become spiritual by free choice along with the grace of God, without which the natural power of the will by no means suffices to move man to spirit. Man is therefore made and said to be like an animal when he abandons the motions, which according to reason and intellect focus on the knowledge of creator and creation and by spontaneous appetite falls into the irrational motions by which brutish animals are aroused by the desires of the body. In this latter way, man absorbs himself completely in the death bearing delights of temporal and destructible things which tend toward non-being the spiritual man however changing his whole way of life for the better is wholly transformed into the likeness of celestial essences thus 
what it is to be in, in his changeless substance comes to him early in accord with the quality of his life, which is adorned with virtues in two ways. Then man is recognized as like an animal, one by his natural subsistence, the other by the irrational motion of his free will, which is inclined toward evil. Likewise, spiritual, both according to the nature and to his good will, anticipated by divine grace, cleansed by action and knowledge, and crowned with the ornaments of virtues, man is recalled to the original honor of his divine image. Okay, so that was book four, and I think I have another part here in book four I wanted to read to you guys, and then we'll skip uh skip to book five and i got three sections in book five and then we're gonna call it a night guys so thank you all so much please smash that like um so it looks like uh we still got plenty of people here smash that like guys uh really appreciate it um okay here we go so then it says, uh, the teacher is asking the student, do you think that another animal besides man has been made in God's image? And the student says, by no means. The teacher says, will you deny that two opposing positions when uh, predicated of God are true at the same time and by no means false, although both are not of the same force? Consider, for example, God is truth, but God is not truth. The student I should not dare to deny it, for he says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But St. Dionysius the Areopagite says in his symbolic theology that God is neither truth nor life. He states he is neither virtue nor light, nor life, and a little later, nor knowledge nor truth. The teacher says, is Dionysius perhaps contradicting Christ, who declares that he himself, that he is the truth? Uh, and then the student says, far from it. And the teacher says, both statements then are true. God is truth and God is not truth. And then the student says, they are not only true, but the ultimate in truth. One statement is made as a metaphorical affirmation since God is the creator and primordial cause of truth by participation in which all true things are true. The other is a statement by negation because of excellence since he is more than just truth. Since the statement God is truth is true for he is the cause of all true things. And the statement, God is not truth, is true because he surpasses everything which is said, understood, or and has any being. Nor am I unaware that you added, although they were not of the same force, for affirmation is less able to signify the ineffable divine essence than negation, since the former is transferred from creatures to creator, but the latter is predicated of the creator in himself beyond all creation. So... Again, very, very interesting stuff there. Getting into the apophatic understanding of God. God is beyond rational categories. God is beyond cataphatic uh, descriptions of God's essence. And so that's what he's trying to lay out there, that God is both, as Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But then he's saying that God is beyond those things because he's the source of their origin, which is true too. If he just had the energy essence distinction, he could just talk about truth as an energy, you see, but he doesn't have the energy essence distinction because he only had partial fragments of the Greeks and he's so wrapped up in his Neoplatonic worldview. He's so emphatic about rational apprehension. Okay, moving now to book five on Paraphysion. Here we go. So now we're on book five, page 298. Uh, the student says, well, then, according to what reason or analogy should we believe that the Lord arose without any sensible or circumscribed form, especially without the one which he received from uh, when born from the virgin? And since he ha was in the example of the general resurrection to come, if he arose without any sex, it necessarily follows that mankind as a whole at the time of resurrection afterwards will lack sex. So we're going to get into the sexlessness, the androgyny of his Neoplatonic framework. Uh, shout out to Frankie D. He throws in 499. And Frankie D says, isn't it that also what Aquinas taught, that man contemplates God through memory and rational thought? Yes, Frankie D. Absolutely. Because this is part of the Western tradition. This rationalism is part of the Western tradition. Because ironically, even though the Eastern church is Greek-based, Greco-Roman culture was per perpetuated in the Catholic tradition. That's why they have statuary. That's why they had scholasticism. That's why philosophy comes out of the West, because these things were part of the Greco-Roman tradition. 
interestingly enough, even though the Greek East, the Byzantine East, the Eastern Orthodox Church um, has a lot of aspects, Greek aspects that the West doesn't, you're right on you're right online here, Frankie D, that we see what we would be 300 years later, uh, er, uh, Aquinas saying the same things that we see er, Erigena already saying here in the ninth century. So you're right on, bro. Okay. All right. We just got a few more here. So, so the student just asked about the resurrection, and it's claiming that Christ um, was sexless at the resurrection, and so won't we be. And so now he's getting ready to get into his androgyny at the resurrection. This is book five. The teacher says, it is superfluous to inquire about this point, for in previous books we were persuaded about it reasonably and in many ways. Besides, we drew our conclusion in accord with the views by St. Gregory and his interpreter, Maximus, that in the future life after the resurrection, the nature of mankind will wholly lack sex, i.e. masculine and feminine form, since it will return to that very form made in God's image. Here's the problem, though. We would agree there's no sex in heaven, meaning we're not having intercourse in, in heaven. Again, we're not Muslims, but we understand the, the soul is gendered. And so I don't understand this because, again, if you go back to Genesis, God clearly made man and woman before the fall. And God clearly told man and woman to procreate and multiply and be fruitful before the fall. So this comes, this whole framework comes from a worldview in which sex and gender are due to the fall. And I just can't see that, see that line of reasoning for myself because that seems contradicting to what I see when I read Genesis. Okay. <clears throat> so then the student says, In the future life, then, there will be neither male nor female. In the single simplicity of nature absorbs it into itself, the twofold sex which now exists. Then the teacher says, why do you hesitate about this matter when truth says generally about men at the resurrection, they will not marry nor be given in marriage, but will be like angels in heaven? Surely we believe that angels consist of intellectual and spiritual body, and we have no doubt that they lack all circumscribed form. When the divine history relates that they often appeared in human likeness, we do not have to believe that they are naturally confined in such likeness. Their human appearance was tempor temporally assumed, or I'm sorry, temporarily assumed since otherwise it would have been difficult or impossible for them to appear to men and to speak with them. If angels then lack all circumscribed form, why is it remarkable if men when equal to the angels will be free from all sexual and circumscription of forms? Otherwise men will not be equal to the angels. Besides this point does not seem incredible. Some bodies are liquid or spiritual and lack circumscribed forms. I do not see that what is liquid or spiritual or and of the purest substance can be contained by corporeal quantities and features any such circumscribed masses since true reason does not allow me to think to such thoughts. You see, that is a platonic framework. This, re this reluctance and resistance to matter in favor of, um, in regards to it being lesser than. You see, that's why orthodoxy is both and. And this is the problem with Erigena is because he's so dialectical. He's always setting things up into dialectical tensions that that is not the orthodox phronema. We do both and. And so we can have gendered people with, with you know, fully human gendered souls with their spiritual bodies because the goal of heaven is not for us to be identical to the angels. This is part of, this is again, part of Erigena reading his own thoughts into uh, the ideas of the resurrection, man was not made to be equal to angels. And this is part of this misunderstanding that he believes, again, that we're going to go back to the state that Adam and Eve were before the fall. And somehow that's genderless, which doesn't make sense and is not consistent with Genesis. That's not scripture. But um, we see this now in regards to a lot of the progressive Christians because they have a different understanding of Adam and Eve. It's called the millennial versus the uh, apocalyptic eschatological frameworks in Christianity. One, the apocalyptic framework is that there's going to be an ebb and flow, but generally speaking, the beast system is coming into existence and we're going to unfortunately move closer and closer to it until it's in full, full blossom, full form. 
Whereas the millennial un understanding believes that the world's getting better and better and better and better. That's why we have female ministers and, and, you know, we marry gays at our church and all this different stuff. This is a totally different understanding. And the people who believe this millennial framework often, not all, but often believe that the progress of history is taking us back to the Garden of Eden, and therefore the world itself is going to become a sort of utopian paradise. That is not orthodox theology, but it is um, it is something, this is a heres this is again where I've highlighted transhumanism or the religion of transhumanism or the religion of technology. All these prominent people throughout history believe that technology was going to redeem us and take us back to the, par back to paradise, back to our millennial utopia. Again, that's not the Christian framework and that's not the tradition of the church fathers, but we see Erigena in a way, he's not fully there, but certainly we're not hearing an apocalyptic framework. We're hearing a, a sort of man is going to become more and more rationally knowledgeable and, and comprehending and meditating upon the primordial causes of creation and therefore taking creation and bringing it back to God. That sounds like a progressive worldview, right? <clears throat> that is not necessarily the, the biblical framework if you include the book of Revelation. Okay, um, I got two more sections here. Um, this one is the student asking a question here in book five. He says, shall we say that irrational animals as well as trees, grasses, and all parts of the world from the highest down were restored in the incarnate God, word of God, the Logos? teacher says, I wonder why you repeat the same thing so often. Didn't the logos, the, the word of God, when assuming humanity, receive all creation, visible and invisible, and save the whole of which he received in man? If he received all creation by receiving human nature, surely he saved all creation and will do so for eternity. The student says, then corporeal masses ex extended in local space and composed of many different parts of the visible species in which the masses are contained and kept from flowing into one will arise at the general resurrection of men. Hence, if the parts themselves rise again into their masses, forms and species with which the visible world is adorned and with which it is composed, it follows that the whole world will not perish, but return to the same state. For if the parts are restored, why not the whole also? The teacher, we do not say that the masses and species of visible and invisible bodies will rise again, but that as we have often agreed that the resurrection of man, they will along with man and in man, the return of their causes and reasons which have been made in man, all animals are rather to be called animals in their causes and reasons than in the corporeal and sensible effects. For where they subsist, they are animals, truly are. A similar understanding should be applied to all the sensibles, whether celestial or terrestrial. Indeed, all things varying in place and time and subject to the corporeal senses must be considered not substantial and truly existing things themselves, but certain transitory images and reflections of them. An example of this principle is the voice and its image called an echo by the Greeks or bodies and the reflected shadows, whether formed in the pure air or from the waters or from anything at all, which they customarily are reflected. All these are proved to be not things, but the false images of things. Therefore, just as the images and voices and shadows of bodies do not subsist by themselves because they are not substances, so those sensible bodies are, as it were, likeness of subsisting things and cannot subsist by themselves. For natural reason teaches that human bodies too, which are now extended in space and varied in, with increase in, in diminutions and move and their species too, whether these general species in which all human bodies participate or the special ones by which the quantity of individual bodies is circumscribed will not be at the resurrection to come, but they will pass into spiritual nature, which cannot be circumscribed by places, times, and proper species taken from quality and quantity. Okay, now we have the very last reading, and then we're going to wrap up this stream. So please smash that like for everybody. I would greatly appreciate that. This is the teacher. This is a new section right at the end of book five. This is literally the the final few sections. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is the com this is the very end of Paraphysion on the Divisions of Nature by John Scotus Regina, and he says it. The teacher here. We have made a fourfold division of universal nature. Remember, the four, the fourfold division of nature is that which is that which creates and is uncreated. 
that which creates and is created, that which does not create and is created, and that which does not create and is and is uncreated. So um, here we go. We have made a fourfold division of universal nature, which is understood as consisting of God and creation. The first species is that which considers and distinguishes nature creative, but not created. The second nature created and creative. The third created and not creating. And the fourth, neither created nor creative. The first and the fourth forms are predicated of God alone, not because his nature, which is simple and more than simple, is divisible, but because it is the object of two kinds of speculation. When I observe that it is the beginning and causes of all things, there occurs to me the true reason, which confidently suggests that divine essence or substance, goodness, virtue, wisdom, and other things predicated of God are created by none, because nothing higher precedes divine nature. Moreover, all things with and without being are created by it, through it, in it, and directed towards it. When I perceive that all things have the same end and the same impassable boundary, for which they strive and in which they establish the limit of their natural motion, I find that it is neither created nor creating. Of course, the nature which is from itself cannot be created by anyone, nor does it create anything. For since all things which have proceeded from it by intelligible or central generation return to it by a remarkable and effable regeneration, and all things will rest in it since nothing will flow from it anymore through generation. It is said to create nothing. What will it create when it will be all things and in all things and will not appear in anything except itself? About the two middle species, we have already dealt sufficiently in the preceding books, and they have been so clearly explained that they are readily evident to those who search for them. For of them is perceived the primordial causes and other and the effects. The one established in causes is created in the only begotten Son of God, in whom and through whom all things were made, and he creates all things which flow from it, i.e. all its effects, whether intelligible or sensible. But the form established in the effects of causes is merely created by its causes and does not in turn create anything for nothing in the nature of things is lower than it. For the reason especially it has been ranked among sensible things, nor in any obstacle presented by the fact that angels or men, whether good or evil, are often thought to create in this world something new and unknown to human uses. Actually, they do not create anything, but in obedience to divine laws and orders, if they are good, they produce something of the material creation made by God and its effects through the causes. If they are evil, they do not do so moved and deceived by the wiles and, and devices of the devil's cunning. Yet all things are set in order by the divine providence, so that nothing substantially evil is found in the nature of things or anything which may be confound the commonwealth of the civil arrangement of all things. And he goes on to, to talk about this division for two more pages, and then he ends it. And so I'll, I'll read the very last paragraph of this entire book. Meanwhile, I ask the readers to... Con uh, the readers be content with the topics already discussed and that they consider not the trifling or virtually non-existent power of my poor wit, but the readiness of my humble and devout endeavors to track down these matters relating to God. I hope that you may be zealous in my defense, if not with rivals, at least with friends who search out the truth and with your defense may rest as much on the force of your keen intelligence as on the results act out in wakeful nights by the dull visions of my mind. You will find this project no heavy task. I believe for as soon as such a work reaches the hands of a true philosopher, it is suitable for discussions they will not only accept it willingly, but will embrace it as their own. But if it reaches those who are more ready to find fault than to be sympathetic, one should not engage in much conflict with such men. Let every man be lavishly endowed with his own interpretation until the coming of the light which converts the darkness of light of false philosophers and changes into the light of darkness for those who rightly know. And that concludes uh, this book. Again, John Scotus Irigina, Paraphysion on the Division of Nature. Uh, major shout out to Jeffrey Ivey for sponsoring today's stream. It was a mouthful. It was a handful. This was a very dense, dense topic for people to get into. Um, so I'll, I want to thank everybody. I want to give a very special shout out to everybody who supported. Thank you very, very much to my buddy, Frankie D. God bless you, bro. 
I want to give a special shout out to One Foot Out the Door. Thank you very much. Give a very special shout out to D Anna. God bless you, sister. Wishing you nothing but the best. A special shout out to First Person Q. A very, very special shout out to Bone Man 538, Jeffrey Ivy. Thank you so much, brother, for sponsoring today's stream. I truly do appreciate it, man. God bless you. And thank you for sponsoring and thank you for all your support over the years, man. I truly do appreciate it. And very, very thank you to BMX 1966 for your support. And a very special thank you to Jesse Marasco. Uh, God bless you, brother. And thank you so much for being part of our community and being here in the live chat. I really do appreciate it. Um, so anyways, that is going to do it for tonight's stream. I am going to be done. <clears throat> <laughs> Frankie D throws in another 499 says, bro, I got to give you credit for plowing through this high IQ stuff like leg day for the brain. Cool stuff, bro. God bless. Well, thank you so much, Frankie D. Yeah, this was, uh, I will admit this was the most time consuming and strenuous sponsored stream I've done. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a full thing on late antiquity or early medieval philosophy and, uh, reading that whole book learning about John Scotus, but it's good because now I got it. Now I have it. I've read the book. I know about him. I know who he is. It, that's what I love about doing these streams is that it, it expands my mental perception of history in the world. So um, I'm, I'm very thankful. But yeah, this one took a lot of effort. And so I apologize to Jeffrey Ivy because it's been a few months to get this one done because to work this book in along with Plan streams, doing schoolwork, uh, life, fitness. It's it's time consuming. It was difficult. So I really want to give a special thank you to Jeffrey Ivy for helping me out, for sponsoring the stream, for being patient and waiting for me to finish uh, finish the stream. So thank you so much um, for that. And thank you, Frankie D, for continually supporting. I really do appreciate it, brother. I appreciate it a lot. And uh, you've always been incredibly supportive of my work. So I, I really thank you for that. And, and thank you, Amptown One. God bless you, sister. Amptown One throws in $5. She says, I may understand this after about four more years of study. <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate it. I, I, hope that, uh, I hope it makes some sense. Um, it is dense. This is dense, dense philosophy. This is, uh, this is not... I mean, you guys, because of all these talks, are going to know more than the average. But um, this is some dense stuff, so don't be, don't feel discouraged if you if you can't wrap your mind around all of it. It's dense stuff. He's working with a lot of references, and as as you, I saw you, Amtown, a lot of wizard words, a lot of wizard words, right? So thank you so much, sister, for the five dollars super chat, and major shout out to Day Gyre throws in thirty ninety nine Australian. Thank you so much. He says, thanks again. Was there wholesale acceptance of Augustine in the West or was there any pushback? Uh, from my understanding, there was very little pushback on Augustine. Augustine basically was the preeminent Western theologian philosopher. And his work so much readily ava available because it was in Latin. And so that was one of the things about... Um, about the the Greek East, like the Church Fathers, the Cappadocians, Maximus. I mean, it isn't until Palamas in his debates uh, were, were here with the Barlamite. So that we really get, you know, the the East really comes into the West, and really, then totally, you know, it isn't even until um, it isn't even until like present day that orthodoxy has been brought into English. I mean, in regards to the Anglo world, the, the English speaking world, the Anglophone world, orthodoxy in all the books and all the stuff really hasn't been translated until the 20th century. And I would say really, really, really it's not till the 21st century where it's they, they, all these works have been available. And then through, you know, <laughs> they die, like Dyer, like uh, father Deacon, like all the orthodox, content creators um and priests like like father hears and father trinum and father spirit and bailey i saw father spirit and bailey's killing it on his uh on his youtube um brother brother nathaniel like all these different people have certainly been spreading orthodoxy but by the time of erigena because we're talking um 
he was in he was in the court of Charles the Bald in like 843, I want to say. And he translated St. Dionysius in 860, finished in 867. He dies speculatively in at in 877. So after he finished St. Dionysius, he almost died. So he finished this book. He wrote this right towards the end of his life. This was his magnum opus. Um, and so God bless him for that. I wish him nothing but the best. And who knows, you know, he may be in the kingdom. We don't know. I mean, he is a, he did promote a Neoplatonic Christianity and, and has some heresies, but we don't know his heart, right? We don't know his heart. But in regards to your question, it seems like there's very little pushback in regards to Augustine and these Western thinkers, they had total access be, being Latin readers and writers. They had full access to the Augustinian works. And that's what makes him unique is because he was one of the early people to actually read the Eastern fathers and incorporate that into his own worldview. But uh, yeah, from my understanding, very little pushback uh, of Augustine, total acceptance of his stuff. And that's why we see the sort of trajectory of Western Christianity the way that it went. But thank you so much, Day Jire, for the support. I really, really do appreciate that. Thank you. And Frankie D throws in 499. He says, would it be justified to say that we all exist in God's mind? He who sustains all life and whose intellect everything comes from, from uh, Matt V. Um, we certainly subs. Okay. So we, we, we are sustained by the energies of God. We are sustained it's the it's the framework of the question I would say as orthodox we would focus more on the energetic reality of the world due to God's love and goodness um, when we start to focus too much on God's mind we move into a sort of platonic framework now it's not totally wrong because the logos is the divine mind of God and as Maximus taught the logi are in the logos and so human nature is rooted in the logos as a logi, a divine principle, a primordial cause for Erigena. Um, and so, yeah, God's mind, the logos does sustain all life. That is, I think that is true. My only hesitancy is where people then move that into, they start moving into like a pan psychic or pan cosmic, uh, pan psychic cosmos. Um, we have aspects of that. Absolutely. I've, I've done a talk and maybe I'll do another one on panpsychism and logos theology. Uh, we do exist in the, in the divine mind and the logos, but just don't focus too much on the divine mind over the physical world. Cause that's part of our both and theology. And so we don't want to get too platonic, but certainly what you said there, it is true. Frankie D. Uh, he said, would it be justified to say that we exist in God's mind? He who sustains all life and whose intellect everything comes from? Yes, that is true. That is absolutely true. But that doesn't mean the physical world is of a lesser degree. And so as long as we're able to maintain that both and, I think we're good to go. And I think that's totally consistent uh, with Orthodox theology, and that's the beauty of it. But you can see, if we get too rational as Erigena, it, we, we lose the appreciation of the physical, right? And And Obviously, God became fully man, fully God. And so matter, as he highlights in the Logos, it's already been redeemed. It's been sanctified through the incarnation. The recapitulation of all things are coming back to the divine Logos. So, uh, so yeah, I think that would be totally, uh, totally good to go. We just have to be careful of our own presupposition. So as long as we continue to keep that in an orthodox phronema, an orthodox mind state uh, framework, I think it's uh, I think it's totally true. So thank you so much, Frankie D, for that. And then Frankie said, um, "Isn't there a scripture about not getting too high up in your mind?" Well, uh, Paul talks about you know how philosophy is the ignorance of the world because we begin with revelation, right? And this is a different starting point. You see, Erigena begins with philosophy and then interprets scripture and faith through a philosophical lens. We, as Orthodox Christians, we begin with revelation. And this is where we get in the tag argument, the transcendental argument for God. We begin with revelation, and we provide our presuppositions. And then we use, as, as again, St. John Damascus, we use philosophy. But we don't begin our worldview with philosophy. 
Irigina begins with philosophy. Philosophy is the end all be all. And therefore we get a propositional spirituality in which it's all about a rational apprehension is how we become like God. It's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. No, it's in the body too. God became fully God, fully man. It's about our relationships. It's about other people. You see, notice how everything he talked about was very individualistic. It's about your own rational apprehension. No, orthodoxy is communal. It's bodily. It's an appreciation of the physical along with the transcendent. It's our eyes are always on the transcendent, but we don't reject and negate the physical. And so it's a subtle distinction. It's subtle, but it's important. Um, so anyways, guys, that's going to do tonight's stream. I hope you guys learned a little bit about the philosophy of John Scotus Irigina, a very important Irishman, a very important man uh, within the history of ideas, and um, certainly had some concepts that we wouldn't agree with, but he's an important historical figure to know about. This work is an important historical work that many people have not read. Um, it, it was underappreciated when it was first written. Um, and it was, it really what didn't become as notable as it has been until the 19th century when, when, uh, the Hegelians read him and interpreted it in regards to he Hegel's, uh, philosophical work with uh, German idealism. So anyways, guys, God bless you all. I will be back potentially Friday. I know I'll be going Sunday. We got a very special stream with, uh, the Rachel Wilson we will be, defending patriarchy and opening it up to other people. So we'll be doing an open, well, me and Rachel will be going back and forth, having a combo, talking about patriarchy, and then we're going to open it up. So if you're against patriarchy, Sunday's for you. You can come on and you can uh, you can debate me and Rachel and go back and forth. And so Sunday is going to be a debate with me and Rachel. I may do a stream Friday. I have one set up that I want to do on has Sam Harris lost his mind? We're going to be watching a few clips of uh, Sam Harris more recently in regards to, you know, he had uh, Trump derangement syndrome. He was incredibly pro jibby jab, you know, and it seems like he's gone around lately and lost his mind in regards to a few topics. So I will see you potentially Friday evening. If not, I'll definitely see you guys Sunday. So thank you all for everything. Again, a very special thank you goes out to Jeffrey Ivey for sponsoring today's stream and everybody who's supported. So thank you so much, Day Jire, Frankie D, um, First Person Q, D Anna, One Foot Out the Door, um, uh, again, Jeffrey Ivy, Amp Town One, and BMX. And thank you, uh, Jesse Marasco. So I will see you all next time. Until then, as always, God bless. <laughs>